button. I pushed the button. Oh. The, we're live now, Roy. We're, we're live. <laughs> Hello, everybody, and welcome to Rec Who Talk. How are you doing out there, everybody? <laughs> Who are you talking to? <laughs> I'm talking to you, sis. How are you? I am doing all right. So glad that I'm here with you. <laughs> you said all right. I know you. I know you're like nervous because you like you're like. Boy, he's all fired up. He's all excited. He's been drinking lots of coffee this morning, and he's going to drive me crazy today. Tons of caffeine. And and look, do you see? The, oh, my gosh. I the, can't believe all these freaking people down here. I know. We've got a great show, like uh, you all don't even know. But what's with the little – wait. we got to stop. Stop. We gotta I'm start a little over. more dangerous because I lost three more pounds. Roy, we got to start over. We mess up the intro every damn time. Where are we supposed to be at right now? Um, welcome to Red Hoop Talk. Welcome. welcome. <laughs> I'm, I'm Roy Melendez. <laughs> I'm Shannon O'Loughlin. I'm a citizen of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and the executive director and attorney for the Association on American Indian Affairs. And, <laughs> and I'm the beloved Roy of Red Hoop Talk, and I am a deus caddo from Louisiana, and in, I have no particular status whatsoever except for I belong to Shannon, and that's it. <laughs> oh, my God. I don't know what's going to happen at this show. Hey, thanks, everyone, for fun. joining us on the chat. We're seeing you coming in. Uh, pop in, say hello, tell us who you are, um, and uh, please feel free to ask our guest questions when they – um, come up. We're, uh, we're not done with an introduction. You can do oh, that stuff when we come out. Someone's got. You're just help. already excited. All right, uh, go ahead. Gonna, this is I'm like this is this this show right here is a redemption for me. All of the shit that you guys gave me for for talking about TikTokers and and native influencers, all the crap you guys gave me, and here we are today, and they're all like. They're laid out before us right now, ready to roll in here and just say, you were right, Roy. This, this is Native America right here. The young influencers in Indian country are here. They're on social media and they're they're strong, they're proud. They're oh, this is gonna be so great. I feel vindicated right now. And have you done your first um, video for TikTok yet, Roy? No, I'm still scared <laughs> because they're all so good. And I'm, I'm just, I'm not as, I'm not deadly yet. I'm just getting a little more dangerous. That's all. More dangerous. Okay. Well, I want to um, spend a second just uh, uh, remembering that, that life isn't perfect right now and things are still really difficult. And I want to thank the people on whose land I stand, the Piscataway people, uh, I'm in uh, their homelands, uh, what's now called Maryland, and um, uh, all over the country. Uh, this is Native American Heritage Month, and hopefully oh. everyone knows where they're standing right now and whose lands they're standing on. Roy, where are you at? I am in the land of California where I want to recognize all the tribes of California, and uh, thank you for the land I stand on. Um, and the best to all the tribes out there. Uh, can I, we bring, did I bring you down? <laughs> no, no, I'm just excited. I'm excited. I'm excited and, and uh, grateful. And you're right. We are going through some, some tough times, but it's exciting times. And this is, look, I know, you know, the, the pandemic is, is, is sparked back up. Um, and it's dangerous out there for people. So in all seriousness, please um, be careful with your meetings. Be careful with your, your family gatherings and things. And remember that and, and be respectful of others. And and uh, just remember that that's still out there. Um, even though these are exciting times and we want to get together and all that. Um, yeah, the message should be we're, we're, we've got some work to do still. But yeah. yes. there's hope. There's hope. And... The hope is coming on our show tonight. That's what, that's what I want to say, because I'm so proud of all of our young Indian people out there that are sharing on social media, that are showing the elders that we got it, we get it, 
and it's time for us to go out and start spreading the message and doing it in our way. Cause that's the way we've always done it is in our way, you know, and we've, we've brought the message from the stories and we've told them in, in our way. And that's what I see out there. And that's what I've always talked about when I talk about TikTok and I talk about, um, you know, the social media in the, uh, in, you know, in TikTok. Even when we've had to do it their way. What's that? Done it, even when we've had to do it their way, because we haven't about? always had to do it our way. When we've had to do things their way, I'm talking about um, the oppressor. No, no, no. I'm not talking about that. Way. I'm no, not talking know, about that. I'm talking about I, culturally, you know, every generation has their way of expressing Indian culture. It, and are you mansplaining me? You a bit. No, I'm not. Don't put that label on me. <laughs> damn you. You little shit. So, <laughs> so what I'm saying is, you know, every Indian generation um, brings the culture in their way, you know, with their modern twist, with their little bit of, mm, you know, the, mm. and I see that like it, the people that we're going to bring up today, I see that in their art. I see their, that, that in their comedy because they're taking modern issues and throwing it into their comedy, you know, and they're, they're, they're not just trying to be like, Oh, I'm tough and traditionalist. This is the way it's going to be. You know, no, they bring in, pop culture, their culture, along with what's going on today. And they're using social media platforms and they're doing it, you know, and the art, it's just, I'm excited. Yes, these kids, these, these young people, I shouldn't say kids cause I'm old. So I say that, but these, these young people, these young um, native people um, are making me proud. And I've always said that on the show that, Hey, everybody's always, you know, picking on the younger generation. These are the people who've come to, to dance us home. They're going to dance us home. You know, we went to sleep and now they're waking up and they're going to dance us home and they've got the platforms to do it. And tonight we get to showcase a whole bunch of them. That's cool. All right. So I want to thank Roy was right. Roy was right. Roy gonna... was right. This guy. Um, <laughs> So I want to say hi to folks in our chat room. Hey, River. River was very helpful last night. Oh, my gosh. Uh, she's my saving saving grace, uh, helping us with our 98th annual uh, membership meeting and showcase on um, uh, young and emerging Native artists. That's where everyone is coming from. These are uh, our guests from last night, our young and emerging artists. And, and I say we just bring everybody up. What do you Boom, say? baby. Or do you want to bring them up one at a time with their names? Or, or should we just them? do a, a, a fluster cluck? Because you've. Everybody. A fluster pluff. Fluster okay. Pluff. We'll bring everybody up so everybody can see their beautiful faces. Okay. And, Let's and do then it. you can bring go. Because you have all their bios sitting right there in front of you, and you're going to give a little introduction for each of them, correct? No. No. No, oh, I'm so going to make still. it up out of memory, memory, okay. memory. Okay. I can talk about a couple of them because I'm like freaking fanboy on a couple of them. It's, yes, yes. All right. Okay. So here they come. Here it is. Everybody. Yawn. Yay. Woo, look at everyone that's here. Oh, my gosh. Welcome, guys. Welcome. So we've got Sienna East, who is comedian. We've got Ryan, who is an artist and photographer. Amazing. We've got Raquel. You want to say something about Raquel Roy. I know you do. Kel's, Kel, <laughs> Kel is a funny girl. We've got Sean Taylor Corbett. Um, oh, Ann Lynn. I see Ann Lynn Taylor Corbett. Is, 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 is Mama with you? No, but I can call her in. Okay, well, maybe so. And we've got AZ Dungy, who is, um, oh my gosh, we're going to get into AZ's work. And then everyone knows Tommy Orange. Every If you don't know who Tommy Orange, I dare you to admit that on the chat. Tommy Orange, author of There, There, um, award-winning uh, Native author. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We're so glad to have you. Thanks for having us. Hi. Hi. Hello. <laughs> yeah, don't feel like you have to keep yourself on mute, man. This is a this is a, a chat like we're sitting around. Uh, let's see what we're at. A, what casino can we be at? We're at a casino, uh, you know, with the with the night, the nice place 
uh, by the bar, but it's not the bar. With bottle service, baby. We got bottle service that going what it on is? over here. <laughs> VIP <laughs> bottle service. <laughs> she don't know what that is. <laughs> yeah, no, that's too not rich. that level yet either. <laughs> Well, so why don't we, why don't I slow down and then um, maybe Dangerous Roy, like drink some water to kind of detox from all the caffeine <laughs> and, and we just kind of go around and, and, and let everyone um, uh, give a little bit of intro about themselves, the way they want to, to speak about themselves. Is that cool with everybody? Do we do this alphabetically? This, let's just start at the what? top with, with Sienna. With Sienna. That's what I get for getting here. <laughs> I've got anxiety, <laughs> Sienna. Yeah. Well, <laughs> hi, I'm Sienna East. I'm a writer. I'm a comedian. I'm 27 years old, member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. Oh. It's super cool to be here. Uh, I am based in LA, and I write, and I make stuff whenever uh, I want to, and I have a good time doing that, and I like doing stand-up. And uh, actually, I'm going to say this now. AZ and I do um, ND and D. We do D and D together, an all native D and D. And so uh, we have we, we do that together. And that's me. Hello. Yeah, we're friends. We're friends. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, cool. I got to come out and see you guys then. Yeah, definitely. It's online. I'm, gonna... it's online. I'm, gonna... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, go ahead. I just said it's online. Oh, you guys no do it online. Going anywhere. Okay. <laughs> yeah, okay. Everyone's staying home. We're on um, the YouTube. Uh, the but YouTube. yes, that is uh, my website. I uh, made a short film when I was in college, and I just finished another short. And I do stand up, and I do storytelling. And so, uh, yeah, uh, those are that's these are all different like things. I just finished a short where I was uh, I play. It was a critique of Julia and Julia, in which I played Sienna and Seinfeld. Um, because I had a lot of thoughts about the way that Julia and Julia made a discussion of art and a lot of issues with it. And I was like, it would be like if I told all of Jerry Seinfeld's jokes in a year. And so I made a short film about that and I took, uh, and I put a lot of time into it. So that's me. Now you know me. Hello. Yeah. So everyone, I put Sienna's uh, website in the chat. So be sure you check her out and uh, bookmark her website. All right. Ryan, would you like to? share a little bit about who you are. Mute. Can't hear you. How about now? There you go. Okay. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Ryan. I'm Lactor Flambo Ojibwe from Northern Wisconsin. I live out in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, artist, mixed media, do all kinds of different things. And then um, I'm also a case manager with the uh, Transitional Living Program and Youth Shelters and Family Services out here. Um, so I do a little bit of everything. Um, yeah, that's essentially. <laughs> and you have amazing art. Thank yeah, you. I've got, I, I wish I would have had, um, you gave such a great presentation last night. I'm going to share, I know that you have a Facebook um, uh, site with some of your art, mm -hmm. uh, or some of your photography. Uh, do you have a, a website too? Um, I'm mostly post on my Instagram, but it's, I will confess it's a lot of memes right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, memes are good. Memes yeah, are good. they're getting me through the pandemic. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So, so check out Ryan. I'll, I'll pull up your Instagram at some point and we'll uh, okay. look at some of those memes. <laughs> <laughs> Roy. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Indians of all nations, I want to bring to you the one, the only, the YouTube queen of Native America, Raquel Quinones. <laughs> Thank you for this. <laughs> I appreciate that intro, Roy. That was great. <laughs> Um, hi guys, I'm Raquel Canones. I'm 29 and fine. Um, I currently live in Cedar Rapids, Iowa, but I'm my tribe is Spirit Lake Dakota. I come from the Spirit Lake Nation in St. Michael, North Dakota. Um, I'm also half Puerto Rican, so um, if you know like a little bit about my life, I kind of like moved around a lot, honestly. Um, so I I don't say I'm from anywhere. I'm just I've lived everywhere. Oh, yeah, um, and so I do. I guess 
I wouldn't call myself a comedian, but a lot of people call myself, call me a comedian. Um, but I started my channel six years ago. Um, and I'm just a, uh, funny person. I've done video, uh, creative stuff since I was a kid. So, um, but I started my channel six years ago in 2014 while I was getting my bachelor's degree. And so, um, but whenever I started doing like writing and, uh, I wanted to be a director since I was a little kid because I just grew up with movies and reading and books and all this stuff. So, um, I really appreciate the art and stuff of movies. I take it really serious. Um, and so, uh, my actual, actually my first ever thing that I did with my kind of embarrassing was all my siblings so we were like i had like this boom box and i would just press record on like tapes and we would just like act out stuff like i would write something and we'd like act it out and like that's where i started <laughs> so um but yeah so that's what i do i'm just i make um i don't know my channel is like a vlog i do like beauty videos sometimes i just kind of like live my life and it's funny and people watch me <laughs> And and Roy thinks you're hilarious. You know what I what I really like about Raquel is that the I, she the first time I ever ran across one of her videos, it was like, it was this really like it was your slang one right, and it was just the oh my god, Valley Girl freaking, <laughs> you know, but res it, it talk. Makes you absolutely know? no sense to watch it, Raquel because you're. You're, you're, it's, yeah. That Y'all, wasn't the first video I came across, I should say, but it was, it was her, her Valley girl, like accent with the, all the res talk. It was like freaking mm -hmm. cracked me up, man. I almost fell over when I started here. I'm like, this girl is freaking hilarious. So I kept listening to her and then she came out with the, um, with the slang one and oh shit, that, 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 that actual, that video blew up. That yeah. video blew up. That like put you on the map because I was watching you before you were like real popular. I was like, this girl's freaking just thank you. I appreciate crazy, that. crazy. Where the hell did Valley Girl slash Res Chick come from? You know, it's the Puerto Rican piece too. The you Puerto know, Rican either. piece too. Yeah, it's all there. It's all there. All together. <laughs> Which I want to move to. We can talk about that maybe. Okay. How about Sean? Sean, you want to introduce right. yourself? I have to do myself. Oh, oh man, after that, I'm just kidding. No, no, no I'm just kidding. Him I'm just kidding. I'm just dropped kidding. him on his head. <laughs> no, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, no, I can't wait to check out um, Raquel. I can't wait to check out your videos. I'm so excited because I love, I love that 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 video you're describing is like so my type of humor. And I got to do a really cool play <clears throat> last year. Uh, do you guys know the 1491s, the the, oh, yeah. the writing group? So I got to do this great play um, called Between Two Knees. And it was the first time I came into contact with humor that was so like in your face. And to say certain things to the, to the audiences we had, mostly, you know, mostly white audiences, it was like, you know, one of the songs is called So Long White People. <laughs> and we have to wave our hands. And like, I got the audience to wave with us and they were singing So Long White People. And I was like, oh my God, what are we doing? But it was, it was, <laughs> It was so great and and so the message really came through and I you know um it's 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 a form of performing that I I admire so much um and I'm I'm just getting into I'm so I'm mostly a uh, an actor what am I saying I'm I'm mostly an actor um my for for like you know a bunch of years doing plays and musicals start off in musical theater um I'll, first of all black feet black and scandinavian but I've played multiple roles early on in my career um, that I don't know if I would play right now. Like uh, I was definitely, well, I'm also Latinx in mi corazón and I speak Spanish and all my friends are, um, I grew up with a lot of Dominican people and um, Col Colombianos. And so, so it's, I, I played a lot of Latinx roles growing up in my career and I got to do in the Heights. Um, I was an honorary member of that cast and uh, the original cast and I learned a lot um, so I, I've done a whole bunch of different things, Shakespeare and, but I, I recently, um, we're very close to having a musical that I co-wrote, a native pop musical called Distant Thunder, that's, uh, going to be produced in Oklahoma City at the Lyric Theater. And I wanted to fuse all the style, I'm a pop songwriter and I wanted to fuse that style 
with uh, more traditional music, but create a contemporary story about someone, uh, someone going back home to Browning, Montana, where the Blackfeet Nation is, and uh, after being away for a long time and discovering things about identity and what makes what makes him who he is, while at the same time realizing the importance of preserving our native language, while an outside oil company is trying to buy land where the language school is based. So it's it's a it's a contemporary story that we're we're getting produced next year. I'm really excited about it, and uh, I'm actually going to be dancing for the first time in, in a grass dance regalia oh, on stage. Man. And that's really a big deal for me because I'm, I'm, uh, I grew up in Long Island, you know, so I didn't, I didn't have a lot of, a lot of my native culture growing up. So I'm, over the years, I've been going back home, my second home and, and really soaking it all in. So that's my, my, my story. Yeah, there's going to be the, the old Indians in the background going, Hmm, what's he doing? Oh, we already had that. We've already you had already that. go through that. Oh, we've been taught. Yeah, we uh, believe me. I've 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 had many conversations. I said yes. I will put that in the show. Yes. Oh. Oh. Okay. I will not show that. Um, and I'm yeah. I, I definitely am very close now to uh, Bundle Holder in in Browning, Montana, who's who's helping me navigate how to show and or how how to how to be respectful while at the same time show who we are in a contemporary musical theater. Yeah. pop setting which is like it's it's a whole new world that i navigating it it's like very there's not a lot of resources to go back to like how do you combine all these things together so we're taking everybody's opinions and advice and it's it's uh you know it's like an eight year journey we've been on so and it'll keep evolving as we go lance says practice that high stepping in tall grass for grass dancers <laughs> makes right. sense <laughs> so let's um uh let's introduce AZ Dungy who is um everyone loves her YouTube Ask a Slave. Um uh, you're <laughs> Pomunky and African American. Uh go ahead. I'm I'm stepping on you AZ. I'm sorry. No, that's it. We're done. <laughs> No, we're not done. Bitch. <laughs> Bitch. Well, first, of all, <laughs> okay, first of all, I'm really excited about what Sean is doing because I love musical theater. I'm a musical theater nerd. I went to NYU for musical theater. You're a um, Oh, yeah, sort of. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, so I, yeah, so I'm black and Pamunky. Pamunky, uh, not as well known a tribe as a lot of people uh out here but we're holding it down with pocahontas and chief powhatan mm -hmm. <laughs> um, jamestown that's that's our crew um but yes i did ask a slave um six years ago and it's about this crazy experience i had working at george washington's mount vernon which is also in virginia um and i portrayed mrs washington's slave maid and I did it for visitors so that they could learn the history of this country. It's very important. Uh, but what I didn't know is that no one, everybody's really dumb and <laughs> no one knows anything about black history, native history, or even just regular old white people history. Um, so yeah, so I took all the crazy questions that I got and some of the interactions I had and I created this web series out of it. Um, and I think you showed the Thanksgiving episode. Well, I know you showed the Thanksgiving episode. Yeah. <laughs> <I showed Thanksgiving. laughs> um, which focuses on the questions I got about native history and culture, um, which was uh, equally infuriating. Um, and now I, I live in Los Angeles and I'm a writer, a television writer. Um, don't act as much, although, you know, anybody has any roles for me, I'm here. <laughs> I play Dungeons and Dragons with Sienna. Oh, that's what you guys meant by D and D. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've got well, an interesting we story. You were down you. With the, we thought you knew the lingo. Sorry, should have pulled you. Up. You think he's kind of a I know. nerd? I know so, more than you know. It's, it's my first time. I think it's Sienna's first time too. 
It's, What's that? It's my first time with a legit game. I have a really weird game I play with my friends where I get to have a gun. So this is my first time playing <laughs> D&D where I don't have to get to have a gun in the game. Yeah, there's no guns because it's the no deepest time. Um, but uh, yeah, so uh, but I yeah I write shows, and uh, she writes it. shows. I write. Does anyone shows? want to like elaborate on what that means when when Az says she writes shows? Does anyone want to elaborate on that? Az, can you please? I wrote this is super right. legit. You're sitting here like, sitting you know, right right show. Right. like we know that you like are working on um, Girls Five Eva is coming out, right? Yeah, Girls Five Eva. Um, it's going to be a very nutty ride, but it's from the Tina and Robert Carlock camp. Tina Fey. I yeah. worked on um, Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. And 20s, um, which was Lena Waithe. And actually, I'm working on a musical, too, with Titus Burgess. Yeah. Titus, who was on yeah. Unbreakable Kimmy Schmidt. I knew, Titus, I knew Titus when he was doing uh, oh, Titus. Uh, um, um, Little Mermaid, and I was doing In the Heights. Oh, my God, that's road. so great. I'll, I'll tell him that we um, visited today. But we're, we're yeah. doing a musical. He's writing all the music, and I am doing the book. Um, and it is based on the preacher's wife, that Whitney Houston and Denzel Washington um, Christmas movie. You guys remember that one? Bring it, bring it out for Christmas. <laughs> anyway, and lately I've been doing a lot of panels about being black and native and solidarity and BLM, and mm -hmm. and I'm very happy about that because. Up until this point in my life, it was an identity that no one seemed to know or understand or uh, care about. So, right, and I think that that way in Indian country a bit too. I think there's uh, a bit, yeah, just a little yeah. bit, a little, yeah. little bit. <laughs> Racism hits everybody. Yeah, a little, a little bit racist. Yeah, uh, <laughs> but all right. we all learned it from our best friends, the colonizers. So. Yes, we did. <laughs> well, I I want to uh, get uh, the most peaceful man in our group. Um, so, so, that, so okay, let me jump in on before you oh, do no. that because Roy's get, Roy's going to so, be talking for you now. But Tommy's like freaking got ice in his veins. I can tell he's just cool, cool breeze. But he looks to me I like when I see Tommy, I'm like, I see. The revolution will not be televised. Do not attempt to adjust your televisions. Native America is about to take over. Stand by. <laughs> That's what I see when I see Tommy. I'm like, this guy is freaking now. You got ice in his veins, man. Oh, I hope you didn't offend Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> no. You're just setting <laughs> setting everyone up for disappointment by saying anything that's not. Uh, he's a writer and he's boring. And uh, no, no, you're not. No way. So um, everyone knows who you are, Tommy. So you really don't have to talk a lot. You can just sit there, and say yeah. Um, but no, thank you. I'm Tommy Orange. Hi, uh, I wrote this book. And um, came out two years ago, and I've been before COVID doing a lot of um, public speaking, which was super terrifying for the first like six months. Um, I sweat a lot in public. I cried twice in front of people, um, but I'm okay now. It doesn't feel horrible anymore, um, and now I don't have to do it in public anymore because of a horrible disease or pandemic. Um, can do it from home. So um, I'm working on another book and it has been hard. It's it's a sequel, right? Are you you're doing a sequel to there there, right? Yep. Man. Can you explain what there there is? Um, so it's a novel about native people living in Oakland, all their lives converge at a powwow. Um and this follows 12 different characters. Um, they all have different reasons for ending up there, but you find out along the way how they're connected. And there's kind of, it's kind of like a heist situation. There's a robbery at the powwow. 
and um, sort of cataclysmic ending. Some might say disappointing. <clears throat> nice. Well, I'm going to read it. I will read it, Tommy. Thank you. All right. We've, so now what? I know, huh? It's like, okay, guys, all of you at one time, start performing. No, no, please. Come on. Come on. We want to, you know, there's a couple of things that I want to share with y'all um, at some point. So if there's a lull, you know, I there's this great song um, from Distant Thunder I want to share. Um, we could share uh, anybody, if anyone has any pictures or anything they want to share. Um, can, uh, I want to say Tommy it may read a little bit for us. And Can, and, and can, what, I, comment what, on what, what? can I comment on Tommy's book? Um, I, you know, Red Hoop Talk, we've, we've brought a lot of guests on, um, and always, always our, our, um, story about our guest culminates in all of us talking about how we were danced back into, um, our culture or how we were brought into the fold, um, or how we rediscovered something or that's, that's kind of like what I noticed a lot about like our show and how we we've we've everybody that we've talked to, we've all had that same story and his book uh, follows that same line. Like how did they all come to that place? You know, how are we all drawn together? And, and that's, that's kind of what red hoop does is that we're constantly bringing people into the fold and we're telling our stories and we're disseminating that information. And it's, it's helping others to um, be able to tell their stories and express who they are uh, in public and uh, amongst each other and, and connecting us all again. Because, you know, when, when like Shannon and I were in the powwow scene and she was going to school and, and uh, this was probably before most of you guys were born. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, we 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 didn't get to connect with people like you guys are connecting. You know, there there wasn't even a cell phone back then, really. I mean, it was like literally like you had to. <laughs> there's a big battery pack, you know, and you, so so we didn't connect with people back east or down south, and you know, um, our back where our nations are, or or any of that. And today, I noticed that that uh, it's so easy for everybody to kind of come. Look, we're all from all different parts of the world and we're all here coming together in this one place and uh, sharing our stories, our experiences and, and our strength and our hope and all of this stuff for Indian country. And uh, it's it's a beautiful thing. And I, and I like how all of our stories and like like uh, books like Tommy's are, are talking about that, uh, all of us being danced back together and being able to share. It's It's really cool, really cool. Yes. Yes. Thanks for bringing us down. I, I, I'm bringing you down. So, so I want to talk about, because I'm going to tell you a secret that I don't share with many people. Okay. Don't tell um, them, And I'm doing it live. Don't tell It's them. a premiere. Um, uh, my, what I always wanted to be when I was growing up, um, uh, besides a veterinarian, was I wanted to be an actor and I would read all the books I could about, from actors, their biographies. I so wanted to be in theater and be an actor. Her that cat's was name was De Niro. My cat's name, I had De Niro, I had Pacino. <laughs> Pacino. Um, uh, that was just what I wanted to do. Um, and uh, so somehow I ended up in law school. Um, not sure how that happened, but I am so, what I'm trying to say is I'm so like um, infatuated with your stories and how you got to do, how you got to be so brave to do what you're doing um, and not just, not just acting, not just performing or doing comedy or photography, um, but you know, how because you're all expressing your indigeneity, right? Um, yeah. it's beyond something that I would have ever dreamed of growing up where I came from. So like, who wants to like, you know, was it hard to do what y'all are doing or did it just kind of come naturally? Um, was it something about uh, are you with who you grew up that kind of, you know, brought you on the trajectory? <laughs> 
Can I start with that? <laughs> Okay, uh, so I've always been really, really expressive. Um, I always express myself through movies, honestly. So whenever I was in high school, I had this notebook I would carry around and I would write. I knew the movies by heart, so I would write them out. So I just, because I just could recite them like word for word or whatever. And that's just kind of like how I express. I really didn't know how else to express myself besides like saying lines off movies or saying. I don't know, like kind of acting like that because I didn't, I really didn't know myself back then, I guess. And like, um, I really was antisocial. So I would just like be home watching movies all the time and not really have friends. So I um, thought like really, that was kind of hard though, because since I wasn't social, I would get bullied and like, I really didn't know how to like deal with all the feelings inside of me. So, um, but I didn't care, I guess at the time, like too, because I, I would still do it. I don't know, whatever. And so, uh, well, I got older, um, so I got married really young. I got married at 21, and he was, like, really into the church, and he wanted to be a pastor, and um, that was kind of new for me because, like, I grew up on the res, so, like, that was kind of a new <laughs> life. And so, um, but anything with the Christian life, I really, like, turned, my creativity kind of just, like, turned off, and I really didn't, I was kind of, like, uh, on autopilot for like seven years because I really didn't know how to express myself because I really couldn't in that sort of world, like that Christian world. I really tried to express myself, but I couldn't. And so I finally got divorced. And uh, while I was still married, though, I created my YouTube channel. But like um, creating was really my outlet for me. It was either like I want to kill myself or I want to create. And I kind of chose to like save my own life whenever it came to expressing myself. Because I feel like it really meant that much to me because I've always been a creative person. So for me to choose like a per like a man over my own creativity, I, I really like was, I don't know, I was ashamed to myself for a long time and I had to really deal with all that stuff. But finally, like me creating like my YouTube channel and like wearing the clothes I wanted and like kind of getting back to what I do, like that was kind of what saved my life, honestly, because I couldn't like live that lie anymore so um that's kind of what <laughs> what my youtube channel really did for me and like creating does for me is like it gets me out of that depression or like living uh for other people like whenever i create i do what i believe and like what i want or and it's what i should be doing so right right yeah. <laughs> i see ryan shaking his head a lot right there ryan <laughs> is your story yeah, well, I, uh, <laughs> well, because, like, today is actually, like, the seventh anniversary of an art advisor telling me to not pursue an art major. <clears throat> um, they told me that my photography had no direction and that I should just pick a different field of study. And so I think I actually had, like, a photo shoot that next day, and then a couple years after that is when I transferred to IA and got my BFA. So... You know, there's a lot of folks that tell you not to do your work or that they think that they know what's best. And so it's easier to just listen to yourself. And I think if you invest in yourself and the work enough that um, you can do it. Um, but yeah, even a lot of the work that I did prior to going, I, I was all just self uh, self taught and like through experimentation. Um, just, you know, buying the camera or buying the the paints and just taking time to learn different mediums. Um, there, <clears throat> I had like a art teacher, I think in like fourth grade that like gave me a D on a painting that I did because it was like too sad. And like, there was no other critique on the work. Um, and so just that, you know, like that kind of experience kind of pushed me towards being more self-taught and like just doing art outside of school. Um, and then, yeah, it really took like a long time, I think, before I even got comfortable enough to, you know, share that work or to feel confident enough to apply to art school and, you know, try to prioritize that as a field that I wanted to be a part of. Um, but we did it, so. I was just looking through your your Instagram. I've got to, I got to pull it up. But, but, uh oh, don't say uh oh. Uh, I love the one the with post. the gun. That's my favorite. That's one of my favorite, but there were some others last night that I really liked. Um, uh, but yeah, so 
Uh, who who else? I mean, Tommy, how the hell did you uh, um, write that? I mean, where did that come from? I mean, obviously, real life, I'm, I'm assuming. Sure. Um, well, it took six years to write. Um, but I wasn't a writer growing up or a good student. Um, I actually played roller hockey for many years. That was my first uh, dream, which is an embarrassing dream to have. Um, but there was a professional roller hockey team in Oakland called the Oakland Skates. Um, and it seemed like, you know, possible. I, I was pretty good. I got sponsored by a company when I was 16 and was traveling around the country doing tournaments and stuff. And then uh, the sport died on a, on a, uh, in Huntington Beach, actually. They, they moved it to ESPN like three or something. And everyone was wearing short shorts and super bright colored. Um, um, their, their equipment was super bright colored. And there were ramps in the back of the net. And it was a ball instead of a puck. And the sport just completely died. And uh, with it, my dreams of becoming a professional world hockey player. Um, and somewhere along the way, I became a musician and went to school for sound engineering. Um, so um, it wasn't until after I graduated and realized I did not want to become like a second engineer in a big studio, which required like the our professors told us if you wanted to do that, you would have to spend two years being like a gopher and cleaning toilets. And um, I didn't even want to do second engineering work. Um, I wanted to do like film scoring for independent films. Um, so I was working at a used bookstore after college, uh, just to make money. Um, and I fell in love with fiction while I was working there and was so behind in terms of, uh, you know, people who know they want to obnoxiously know they want to uh, be a writer since they're three and they're like reading books when they're three. Um, I, you know, I knew I was behind, so I obsessed over it for the next like seven years just reading and writing as much as I could while working um, in nonprofit, the Native American Health Center in Oakland. Um, and uh, it didn't start writing something serious until I found out I was going to be a father. That was kind of a catalyst for um, taking the writing more seriously and taking on a project like a novel. Um, and, uh, you know, had a, all the experience of growing up in Oakland and growing up with this white mother and native fathers, Cheyenne father. And then all this time uh, in the Oakland native community, I, I did a bunch of digital storytelling work in Oakland and all around the country and um, in groups, uh, marginalized groups that don't normally um, get their voice, their stories told, teaching non-writers how to write their stories and make short films for, you know, not like serious short films, but um, just for like nonprofit use for messaging and um, fundraising and stuff like that. Um, so I, I, not really knowing what I was doing, I was pretty self-taught when it came to writing, just, you know, just from reading a lot and reading craft books. Um, I spent the first three years of writing it um, pretty much in a vacuum, um, just knowing that I wanted to tell this story. Um, Oakland is not very well represented um, in the media and the urban native story isn't either. Um, so I was convinced enough to keep working on it. Um, after the first year of writing on it or writing into it, uh, I, I had to read for um, a group of native youth for this suicide prevention grant. Um, it was the scariest reading I've ever done um, because we had, you know, they were hard to reach and they weren't getting excited about very much programming we were doing. But they had a big reaction to it a year after starting it. And that really propelled me forward because they, if I could connect to them, native youth from Oakland, then uh, that was all I needed to, you know, feel like I could, that I was doing it for a reason and that it connected to people on the outside. Um, so then I got into the Institute of American Indian Arts um, from 2014 to 2016. It was my writing life was a lot more structured. I had accountability and deadlines and faculty and getting tools from the MFA about like what it means to write and think about writing and craft and all that. Um, and um, after I graduated, um, it's kind of a, a timing thing in terms of how it, it got published. Um, it was October, 2016. 
and I was at a writing conference and somebody heard me read. I was a fellow. I read for like seven minutes from the book and they, um, they told me to send me, uh, send them my manuscript. Um, and they wanted to send it to their agent and then nothing really came of that. Um, until Trump got in, in 2016, I'm not trying to credit Trump, my success, but there was a, t there was a timing thing. There was like a call to action and, and for literary people, uh, this was their call to action. Um, and it was also standing rock that was happening at that time. And, you know, people wanting to really do something. Um, so I, she sent it to her agent. They were super excited about it. She happened to be one of the biggest agents in the industry. And um, by February the next year, um, kind of like post Standing Rock and post Trump, um, I attribute it to like why it got the attention it did because lots of books, lots of great native books and talent um, over the years have not been recognized uh, by people of color in general. Um, and it's, you know, it was post Trump um, leading up to now that we've really come to pay attention to things uh, in a more significant way. And so, um, the book went to auction and had this insane morning where I got a text message from my agent and she said, uh, Sarah Jessica Parker wants to talk to you. And I was like, what? I don't even know what that means about my book. Um, she was in a, she was in a book club with an editor from Hogarth, an imprint of in Penguin Random House. And, uh, she was like trying to start her own imprint. So I, I had a conversation with her later on that afternoon and she wanted to, it was supposed to go to auction and she wanted to buy it before it went to auction and um, ultimately decided not to do that because it seemed, it seemed like a bad idea to have her. The, the editor said that Sarah Jessica Parker would be the face of my book and that seemed like insane to be like, yeah, that sounds great um, as a debut native novelist to, you know. Um, so it went to auction and it, um, you know, it, it sold to Knopf and they took really good care of me in the book and publication. And uh, then it went on to do cool things. Yeah, for sure. Yes, everybody. Uh, uh, and I'm like quiet over here, Tommy. I'm sorry. I mean, I say that I'm a really big fan. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm like, I'm whenever I heard that you were going to be on here, I was like, going crazy and like my ex-husband actually read your book i haven't i have it on audible i read the first three pages and i couldn't i like cried so i i was really, really emotional so I, I just like okay another time like i'll leave for another time until i can like compose myself but like i'm a very i really respect your work and i i can't believe yeah that you're right there in front of me thank you yeah i'm sorry i like go find girl you <laughs> Yeah, yeah, there's something that, um, and I was telling you a little bit about this, Tommy. I, I had an, uh, well, actually Roy and I um, had an elder, um, and this was in, in Southern California. And I, I used to tell him, man, I just want to get out of here. I got to get out of this concrete place. I just, I need to get out in the woods, you know, when I'm, I'm in my 20s. It's like, I need to go on some kind of quest. I need to do something. And, and he's like, what do you think that is? under your feet. What do you think that concrete's made out of? What do you think? What do you think that building's made out of? It's like the creator is all around you. And so when I read in, you know, in, in your book, you're talking about urban natives and, and how we belong to the city. And, and I was just like, it, it hit me so hard. And I know I asked you to read that version, that part of, of your, your book, that passage um, for my own, uh, uh, you know, uh, personal, <laughs> but, um, do you want to read anything? Sure. Um, I can read, that. I can read that part. And Roy, you're going to love this. Maybe. I don't know. Oh, I'm getting the book. This is from the prologue. Urbanity. Urban Indians were the generation born in the city. We've been moving for a long time, but the land moves with you like memory. An urban Indian belongs to the city and cities belong to the earth. Everything here is formed in relation to every other living and non-living thing from the earth, all our relations. 
the process that brings anything to its current form, chemical, synthetic, technological, or otherwise, doesn't make the product not a product of the living earth. Buildings, freeways, cars, are these not of the earth? Were they shipped in from Mars, the moon? Is it because they're processed, manufactured, or that we handle them? Are we so different? Were we at one time not something else entirely? Homo sapiens, single-celled organisms, space dust, un unidentifiable pre-bang quantum theory. Cities form in the same way as galaxies. Urban Indians feel at home walking in the shadow of a downtown building. We came to know the downtown Oakland skyline better than we did any sacred mountain range. The redwoods in the Oakland Hills better than any other deep wild forest. We know the sound of the freeway better than we do rivers, the howl of distant trains better than wolf howls. We know the smell of gas and freshly wet concrete and burned rubber better than we do the smell of cedar or sage or even fry bread, which isn't traditional, like reservations aren't traditional, but nothing is original. Everything comes from something that came before, which was once nothing. Everything is new and doomed. We ride buses, trains, and cars across over and under concrete plains. Being Indian has never been about returning to the land. The land is everywhere or nowhere. Mm. <clears throat> Very good. Very good. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you. <laughs> All right, show's over. <laughs> I got what I wanted. <laughs> No, thank you so much, Tommy. Uh, your your book is very meaningful in all different ways to many of us, and, and we're so proud of you. Thank um, you. Okay. Everyone in the chat room, feel free to ask questions of our guest tonight. Um, so let's keep let's keep trucking here. Sienna, you feeling anxious about anything? <laughs> No, I well, I have to pee, baby, but like I'll get over it. I'll get past it. It's fine. It's just it's a the vague notion of peeing. I think is almost worse than really needing to pee. It's like it's gonna be there eventually. Yeah. So Hell, I gotta pee. That's where I'm at. <laughs> Everybody's gotta pee. Hey, if you got it, if you got to, Everybody you know, knows. it's okay. You know, not not here. You know, go no, I'm good. <laughs> Go, go over there. But it's definitely interesting thinking about, you were asking about like performing and writing and thinking about indigen indigeneity in relationship to it is something that I never thought about until like uh, people asked me to think about it. I was just writing about myself and my experiences and my family. And people be like, wow, this sample has a really interesting native perspective. And I'd be like, that's just my grandma. Like my Nana just says stuff like that. And so um, I eventually started to unpack kind of like what that meant because I like performing and I like talking, but like I wrote myself and I perform things as myself, you know? And so when I started writing and people saw the lens or when I started going out for roles that had a pre-existing uh, decision of what a native person should be like, um, I had to start kind of like reevaluating like how I need to be analytical of my own indigeneity and relationship to art. Like, cause I've gone out for like, like native princessy roles where you're supposed to be wise and stuff. And I'm never gonna get them. My boss one time, I was like, when I was a writer's assistant, I got a manager that started and um, and my boss was like, oh, how do you think you're gonna do? And I'm like, does this voice sound wise? Do you trust this voice? When this voice tells you to like look inside <laughs> yourself, are you really gonna, like you're not. And like, that's fine. And so um, when you're talking about like how that affects like the process of me choosing to be out there, it's just me wanting to be seen like as me. And that's about, that's like as far as like I get with that kind of stuff. Because I'm answering the question from 20 minutes ago because I was like, I've made my decision. How I answer <laughs> I'm, glad <laughs> I'm glad you did. I'm glad you did. Thank you. Thank you. But yeah, so I just like to do the things I like to do. And sometimes they're about like being native and sometimes that's just inherently a part of the way I view the world regardless of what's going on. So it, yeah. So I have something I actually yeah, was quiet. thinking about because uh... I feel like, okay, so I feel like especially as a native person or like a creator, like especially that we're native, I don't know, we have, we like navigate in two worlds because we're native and like obviously we live in like America. So like everyone has their assumptions on like what we're supposed to be like or act like or whatever. And so one struggle that I always had was like, I wanted to create content, but it's like, oh, you should do a native Da, da, da. you should do this about native stuff and it's like i do what i believe for like native things i never saw myself as like a native youtuber i just saw myself as a youtuber because i 
come from the res and like I'm just me or whatever. Like I just do whatever I believe. Like same thing as like what Sienna was saying. But it's like I feel like sometimes the world wants to like put you in a box and like put especially natives. Like they want to put us as like our own little category over here and like we only do native things or like we have like these certain roles we can play and stuff. But I always wanted to break that barrier because I think that we can be like universal if we have like a bigger mindset. We can break into mainstream i feel like i don't know that sounds weird like i always saw it as mainstream anyway because like we're everywhere so i never saw us as like over here i saw us as everywhere right. <laughs> right for sure yep i mean i i would say too i put a lot of my early work was very identity focused because a lot of native artists like our work is consumed by people who are not indigenous and then they tend to either rate the work on whether it's native or not. Like one of my first art shows, I showed like contemporary photography and you know, like there was just no response or like there was, um, <clears throat> they were just like, oh, like these are cute. And like, I took a native American studies class once and you know, like very, like that wasn't my audience, um, you know, but I also wanted to create work that established who I was when it came out. So that way you didn't have to question it. You know, I didn't want work that was just gonna be queer or just gonna be indigenous or just two spirit, like all that work is that all the time. You know, like whether regardless of the subject content or regardless of the material that you're using, like that art that I put out is always gonna be two spirit, you know, and that I just wanted to make sure that that, that is what I established for myself as an artist. So that way there wasn't no, there weren't questions or there weren't assumptions on who I was, you know, that that work <clears throat> spoke for itself or that, I made sure that I could see like an interview before it went out. So that way I knew that it was worded the way that told my story as opposed to someone pulling the the interesting stuff from it and, you know, putting out an mm -hmm. article. Yeah. I'm going to share something and not everyone's going to know what this is. So, um, mm -hmm. but it's hilarious. <laughs> Can you all see this? <laughs> I've got to increase the size. Is it a turtle head? <laughs> That's part of it. Oh no, it's a turtle head butt plug. <laughs> yeah, but look at look at the, the comment. Snag. Babe, let's role play. Me, okay, I'll be Turtle Island. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I'm sure you it's hilarious. <laughs> Did you see the first comment was okay, I need to save yeah, this. You okay. didn't set that yeah, one up, yeah, Shannon. You just threw that I, one. Uh, I, <laughs> yeah, I told Dakota I had to smudge halfway through making that one. <laughs> hey, man. She was like freaking sh as shocked as I am right now. <laughs> but but see, that's a, that's the thing about, I, I think, Native people, you know, and that's why it's so hard for us not to, you know, um, ha have you all ever seen a, a sexual harassment policy in a tribal... <laughs> Nobody can nobody can keep straight with a sexual harassment policy because we don't see our life like that. I mean, it's it's one of those natural things that it, it's okay to be a little bit. Uh, some people inappropriate. Call it snag. Snag. <laughs> snag. Snagging is consensual. Yeah. <laughs> as long the as the snag was consensual. Yeah, not in the workplace. Okay. Not in the workplace. Especially with my boss. I'm kidding. <laughs> I mean, I think though too, like natives are like funny. And I think the fact that we are like making memes and like contributing to like, you know, indigenizing a lot of the stuff that's being more popular now, like that that just adds to our conversation and adds some more relatable content and community on social media. Oh, Ryan, I was going to ask you if, have you made any art about something else? Like that whole something else? <laughs> I made, I think, a couple of memes, but haven't made any art yet. On, <laughs> but I consider memes to be art at some level. <laughs> yeah. And somebody said something in the comments, which is my feelings exactly. Uh, first of all, Sienna, when you, when, when you, um, when you see Sienna, when I see Sienna, first thing I see is, like you said, this princess you see a princess when you open oh. your mouth i see strength i see smart i see got it going on i see intelligence i see all so don't sell yourself short you you've you've got a lot of power in your voice and and who you are it's 
your outward appearance is, 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 is as soon as you open your mouth, that goes away like instantly. So you <laughs> you are, and and I know you laugh, but I'm telling you, you got it going on. You you do. You're smart. I can tell. So don't even try that one. But anyway. And Ryan, awesome stuff, man. That is freaking funny. Is that <laughs> and Raquel, you, um, uh, oh, now I lost my train of thought of what you said earlier. I was going to talk about it, but that's okay. It's senior moment. It's okay. It's a, I think we're, can, can we hear AZ's origin story? Try oh, well, at first, <laughs> I'm not over there on my screen, so I don't know what to do. Um, but I was going to say was about Sienna, like I um, related to what you were saying. I think essentially you're saying like roles haven't been made for what you are yet. And um, yeah, and I think that's a frustration that a lot of us have. And certainly I I did. I went, I, I was uh, obsessed, like I said, with musical theater <laughs> and um, and acting. And I think part of that was because um, like for many of us going through trauma, um, a way a way to deal with that is through humor, and something I learned pretty pretty early on. And um, and also I was very shy um, when I was like I'm still shy, but I, I was very shy when I was um, like a preteen and teenager. And the stage was kind of where I could try on different personalities and feel surprisingly free, <laughs> even though it seems like that would be the place where you'd feel the most um, anxiety. Um, I felt the least because I, I would, I even said this, like I didn't have to be myself. Like it was, it's me that I was having a problem with, not, not these, I got to be somebody else. So that was very attractive to me. Um, and although I went to a science and tech school guys, like I, I was, I, I, I had like a very um, in, intense um, academic life. So um, I've always kind of felt pulled in two directions. Um, but I, I went to NYU um, and when I, when I got out, I was like, okay, like, what do I do now? <laughs> and part of the, what do I do now is because like, I, I didn't really feel like I fit anything. Um, and I don't know if you remember, like when um, Keenan from SNL, when they asked why why there hadn't been any black women on SNL, um, and he was like, "None of them are ready." So it, it, that kind of opened up the, this discussion about how there were no women of color as uh, and black women specifically in that case, um, you know, in comedy. And so um, I ended up feeling like what my mother told me to begin with, which is that I would have to write my own stuff. Like I'd have to like make the stuff that I wanted to be in. I didn't necessarily want the first thing to be a slave, but <laughs> it just ended up that way. Um, just because I had this great story and I felt like it was more than just the experience that I had. It was like a comment on where we are as a society and um, the, you know, how we don't see each other. Um, well, really how the dominant society doesn't see us. Um, and and when you don't see, I think when you don't see the people in history, you really don't see them as active role engaged in society today. Like it's not, it's you, you know, we're their their narrative is the narrative, and we're just sort of side pieces to their narrative, yeah. which which at the end of the day is our humanity, right? Like we're not a part of this story. And until we're a part of the story, you know, we won't have the same level of, of respect or agency. So that's kind of where I ended up when I was writing that. Um, but then I also just wanted it to be funny because I was just like, I need to like, again, deal with this trauma I went through. Um, and my best way of doing that is, and I think our best way, like just in culturally is, um, is through humor. But one thing that I've always had personal difficulty with is integrating my whole self into my work because of being both black and native. And as we're saying, like, as a native person, you're already walking two worlds. <laughs> but then I also have black and 
that's what I present as to, to most people. So, um, and then I also have the, the history of my own tribe where you literally weren't allowed to be part black to, and, 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 be a part of my tribe. Like they literally outlawed association with black people. So um, my family history, my tribal history, like a lot of stuff. Trauma. But all I want to do is just laugh. Like I don't like guys, I just want to laugh. Like, um, <laughs> no. um, but then also, you know, my first job was Kimmy Schmidt, right? That was my first job. Um, I'm skipping a lot of things, but <laughs> what happened was I did my web series it blew up in a very good way. And I think part of it was because the discussion was being had about like, you know, where are the black women, where are the women of color in the comedy space? And it happened to be having the exact moment that <laughs> my web series came out. So the first thing I did was they had like a secret audition for black women um, for SNL. And um, it was literally a secret. Um, and I did that audition and out of that, I got my agents uh, in writing and in acting. Um, and they both were putting me in for stuff and they were just like, we'll just see which one sticks, you know? And writing was was the thing that I got first. And my first job was Kimmy Schmidt. Um, Tina Fey happens to be one of my my personal idols. Um, I spent a lot of my teenage years forcing my, my mother to watch sketches um, that she was in with Maya Rudolph. <laughs> I was just sort of, and she'd be like, yes, they, they are very funny. Um, I should mention my mom is a scientist. So it was, my mom's a sociologist. So she was just like, I don't know who this person is that I'm raising, but good luck. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, when I got to that room, you know, I realized, okay, I also felt a big burden because like I'm in a space that most people don't get to be in. And I guess, I, what I learned was how much that can be really good. I learned so much and I, I really appreciate the work we did, but then there were things that I wish we had done differently. But, you know, at the end of the day, all of this goes through the lens of, of white people, like the way that they see us, even when they're trying to do the right thing. And when they're, when they're trying to make the right kind of a joke, um, and the right kind of a storyline that's making the, the point, it's still their idea of the point that needs to be made. Um, and, and when we were talking, when Raquel was mentioning, you know, you want to be mainstream, like that's what I've come up against is like mainstream means or has mean meant um, through the, still through a filter that is relatable to white people. Like, and and e even as we move forward in like our representation, we still have to make compromises in the way that that's done because they're the people making the decisions and they're also the audience that they're catering to. to. So that has been something that I, as a black and native person have been like struggling with, like personally and just frustrated with. But I do feel like right now it's just such a, a precipice where they're finally realizing that like we have the the power uh, as as consumers that they didn't realize we had um and that they can actually trust us <laughs> as heads of these rooms like i mean guys i was in a room that was all black people it hasn't the show hasn't come out yet but it was all it was the the show was all black women i actually wrote a native character sienna knows about that um but the, the, the show was all black women. The staff was all black writers. The head who created the show was a black woman. And then they put to be her co-EP, you know, co-executive co, co um, executive producer was a white man. And it was just like, because I guess we needed that. I don't know, like, I'm still baffled. Like why? And, and, and a lot of our stuff in the room, we'd be like trying to explain to him why a joke made sense or try to explain to him why a storyline was something we wanted, you know, it, and he, a lot of times would just cut it out. Cause he was just like, ah, if I don't get it, the studio is not going to get it. like, and it was just, so they, they still don't necessarily think we can be in charge. They don't know what that looks like, but, but as people have gotten into those roles more and more, like I'm excited. Cause I feel like 
we're getting the reins and we're actually, you know, a part of what's going to be the next step, which is, you know, here's what we want to put into the world. If you don't get it, get on Google and find out this, find out what something else means. <laughs> like, find out, like, you know, like catch up to us as, a, as opposed to us always having to, you know, like censor ourselves and make ourselves what you, what, what you want to see. So that I don't know. I I probably rambled. I don't know if that. Uh, <laughs> you know, you made my so origin. Hard. My origins are confusing. That's a perfect story, <laughs> which should be a show, actually, and it could be a great comedy where there's the white producer, right, and then oh. you all end up having to duct tape him or, or like <laughs> kidnap him. And Stick him in a closet have, somewhere. You have to find no, stuff him. And, um, he's gone. <laughs> no, just like every every show, you guys figure out a way to make him not be there. Uh, yeah, some a, a car accident or you know, <laughs> some emergency happens. It's always something. His plumbing goes out in his house and halfway drowns him. You know something. Yeah. But somehow the work gets done without him. How did that? <laughs> exactly, and there you go. But then and then he goes, looks like the hero, so he allows yeah, he it get, to all he keep happening. Credit, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So he, just, he just says, "Okay, just let it keep mm -hmm. happening," even though he gets suspicious. Mm -hmm. <laughs> It's, it'll still great, be told. Great idea. People like, <laughs> that's the main point, right? Yeah. So you've been quiet over there. Oh, no, I was just, I was going to jump in and just say, you know, that happens in, it's happening in the Broadway community as well. And uh, um, it's, it's one of my good friends, Warren Adams. He's a producer with Walk, Run, Fly Productions. And during this pandemic, and and everything going on in this time he he really he gathered some great minds brandon victor dixon is a big broadway star is is one of his partners in that organization and they just approached a bunch of uh production broadway production companies saying you know we need more representation uh at the top top levels because that's when the real decision making happens up there and until we break into those rooms, then we still have those those challenges. However, we see we have to start there, so we're we're having the challenges, but at least we're having some impact. And and uh, yeah, it's I with me, you know, I grew up in the business because my mom is a choreographer and director, and she actually directed uh, a musical on Broadway called Swing. And she was the director and choreographer, but they still, they still had a uh, a veteran male pre uh, director come in to oversee the final product. So I remember her talking about that back then. And you know that's that's weird. But you're the director and choreographer. Why is there a need for another person to, you know? So it's, um, but I I I grew up in the business. My father was in the rec recording uh, industry and. You know, he worked with really cool folks like Mariah Carey, and I think I went. Uh, he says I went to Disney with her when I was a little kid, but I don't remember that. But I think he's he's telling the truth. But um, so on that side, I had like this cool music business world, and then on my mom's side, I had ballet, the ballet world, and musical theater world, and I saw how hard the life was, and I decided yeah. for myself, I think I need to not do this professionally. So I, I went to college for international relations and I studied diplomacy. I went to Israel and Palestinian territories and I wanted to I wanted to work. I, I saw a lot of similarities with the Palestinians in Israel and, and native people around my junior, senior year. And I started writing a paper about that. And then I realized maybe I need to, why am I going across the world here? Maybe I need to work at home, I, you know, with my own, with my own people. Um, and so I was fully planning on working at the State Department and becoming a diplomat. And uh, I got the lead role in Pippin. And and then I, I told my mom, I was like, Mom, I think I got to try this in New York for a year. And she was like, All right. So I just I, I met a bunch of people uh, who gave me some shots. I got a kids TV show called High Five. We filmed in Australia. I was like, I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no training. Um, and I learned on the job. I 
I sang pop songs and I danced for little kids and it was freaking awesome. And we, all these great lessons. I learned the impact you can have on working with young kids. And, and it, it really like became a role model for all these youth, which was really amazing. And then from there, I just, you know, it rolled into all these different, uh, great shows. Um, but all the while trying to find, I, I didn't even think about my identity in performing back then. I was just like, I want to do this. I'm going to do this. Um, I was a mix of, I'm a mix of so many th things. I was kind of grasping at stuff, you know, and I, um, so I would play, you know, like I said, I played in the Heights. I played a bunch of Latinx roles and then I got to play Frankie Valley and Jersey boys. And so I was doing the Italian thing and, um, and then all, but all the while I was like, I, 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 so I didn't play a lot of native roles when I started acting. It's I, only within the last like five years. Um, but really since I started writing my show, it's been this each year is a pro progression of like getting further and further into who I am as a native person, as a, as also as a black person. Um, because I grew up in a really, uh, a white culture and my mom is white. Um, so it was like each year I went along developing this musical and going and, and, and also being in Browning, Montana and being with Blackfeet, being with a lot of my native friends at Native Voices at the Autry in LA, um, all these great minds, uh, uh, you know, Delana Studi, uh, Randy Reinholtz, um, all these really, Joseph Firecrow, um, my mentor, Dow Robes Kip, who was like the most, famous preserver of native languages uh, be before he passed, he most well recognized. Um, so I had all these influences and the show each year would also change because I, I grew up in such a Western theatrical environment. I, I created a native show in a very Western style, you know, like musical theater. So each year the show also started breaking that mold, the more native influence I had in my life and also from other actors and elders that saw the show and it's been really beautiful so it's become <clears throat> i don't think i'll ever stop working on distant thunder because it's kind of who i am you know i might as well tattoo it on my back um it's a theater company it's like it's a whole shebang uh and uh i'm going all over the place here but recently i got into audiobooks and and voiceover acting and actually tommy's there there is my first audiobook i've ever done that's you and one of four one of four actors <laughs> yeah so I, I i i auditioned it was two years tommy i had done i auditioned for dn audio and i said my voice sat in a little database and two years later they called me up and they're like hey we got this book it's there there check it out you want to do it i was like yeah let's do it I, I i've never done this before i'd love to do it so i they had a director in the studio i mean it was a real serious they were taking this real serious i was like oh this, this book's going to get some action now. Uh, so, and obviously when I read it, I was like, wow, <laughs> this guy just like captures experiences that I've had or that I've heard about or talked about um, that I could never articulate like that. And he just like got it. You know, it's like, yeah, that, that's, that's, uh, that's how I feel. I'm glad he wrote it because I couldn't say it like that. Um, so when I got to voice that, it was pretty phenomenal. And I've, he kind of launched me on my my audiobook career now so that's been thanks tommy <laughs> oh that's so cool that that was that's amazing that was your first uh your first audiobook yeah. i i got to be a part of the the um i don't know casting oh really um oh. a little they included they included me and you know i so i got to hear you and i was like yes and oh, cool, man. uh it was such a it's such an awesome cast for the book and yeah, i was right. i was really grateful because i didn't when it was done i didn't want to read it um, and so to have other people read it, that was, it was a way for me to go like experience the book as a, as a book. Wow. That's cool. Yeah, it was, yeah. it was an amazing performance. Thank you. Oh, thanks. Thank you, man. Thank you. That's um, really cool. Sean. Yeah. So that's kind of me all over the place in a nutshell, but you know, my, my, the, I should say also that the main character in the show is a lot of my life. You know, a lot of the stuff, uh, my mother and father separated when I was five, I'll, all of our dynamic as a family and the struggle of finding my relationship with my father again, it's all in that, in the show, um, as well as the loss of my mentor, um, Daryl Robes Cape and Browning and his family 
and the, and saving the school and the language. I mean, it's it's a uh, so it's a, I hope you guys all get to experience it one day because it's you know that's uh, that's me up there. So to hear all you writers out there, you know, to to hear your words, it's so scary as you all know. And like you sit in the audience or I'm <sighs> backstage, and I'm like, oh. I, I wrote that and they do they like it or and then I'm acting in it and I'm like what did I do this is way too much pressure but um yeah. I'm glad I'm glad to to get to do it that's awesome yeah, um, yeah I, I got to see Distant Thunder yeah, it, right. what do they call it a staged reading a staged yeah, reading. staged reading yeah staged reading. Off book in New York reading. and it was awesome and what was so awesome about it is it was the first time you know because sometimes I imagine. Uh, and, and some of you who are into musicals may kind of be like this, where you're you're walking along, thoughts are going through your head, and all of a sudden a song pops up, and so you, part of you just wants to go nah, and 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 do the song, <laughs> right? Like like you're in musical theater, and and here I am watching the stage reading, and and people are Indians, they're singing. <laughs> it was just like the most awesome thing it was like it was like you know your favorite bag of chips it was it was just for me i i loved it and i can't wait for um i think next year right 2021 yeah 2021 yeah, yeah. we want you know we wanted to have like i saw firsthand lin-manuel skyrocket you know from doing in the heights and off and i was like i want to have a native show like that you know like yes. i I want to have that in mainstream. I, I also didn't realize the value of taking it regionally and home. I, I'm so happy going to Oklahoma, being in, in that just incredible, culturally diverse place mm -hmm. and being surrounded by indigenous people. Um, but I want both, you know, I want to have the regional impact and always have that. But I also want to like be in New York, you know, I want to take the show all the way to the top. and. It's hard. It is so hard to get a musical produced, but we're getting there. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm just glad, Sean, that you slapped down the Italians and said, "Bam, take that iron eye, Cody." <laughs> That's right. You know what? <laughs> flip it on its head. You flipped That's it, bro. Right. You flipped it finally. Indian I, like, I can play, Italian. play Italian. I'll play Frankie Valley better than no. <laughs> but all your stories are are extremely good. My, I, I believe it or not, Roy was in Hollywood, and. Uh, I, I I started out. My first gig was <laughs> I was a voiceover guy too, but they were having me. I was like I was like 22 years old. I was very young. My voice was even more crackier than it is now, and and they were having me do these uh, the you know the commercials, the like Channel 56 commercials where they the CDs uh, they're they're advertising the CDs and like classical music CDs like Beethoven and Bach and and all the all the the um the the uh, the the titles of the songs are running down and I'm supposed to be talking about all of this stuff that's what they had me doing voiceover for it's like that, I, that was it was the wrong person to be doing that but so I I did voiceover work for that um and then of course running around in Hollywood um real from Michael Edmonds was my cousin uh, ran around with Steve Revis and and Saggy and and all of those guys back in those days you know and uh it was it was it was hard, but being persistent and consistent is the way to do it. You guys are all, you know, the the, the work will show up. You just keep being you and keep doing you, and and continue to be consistent and persistent and just bang it because Hollywood will chew you up and spit you out, man. It is it is rough. That world is rough. But if you continuously be resi resilient, you you'll get there. What happened to me eventually is I got into radio and uh, I, I worked for K Rock and. And uh, I was a morning show producer for Kevin and Bean. And, and so that was kind of like my break in. I ended up in radio. I went there to Hollywood and I ended up in radio. Um, unfortunately, radio chewed me up and spit me out too. And I ended up uh, homeless in the streets, but that's a whole nother story. But um, yeah, it, keep, keep being persistent and consistent, guys. And you too can end up in radio and on the streets. Or homeless. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I, yeah, I didn't I, have a better I, story. I, I wish it did. Do y'all ever in, in wanting uh, to explore the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints? I'm not a member of. I was for four months. But anyway, I was in some Mormon videos that they use, that the missionaries <laughs> use when they go all over the world. <laughs> what anyway, not to be. <laughs> Don't be her. Um Anyway, that's they were story. slut shaming you on the on their videos. <laughs> no. I think it's so cool to hear about like everyone's first project and all that. Yeah. Like, 
of like where we started or whatever. I think my first time with radio, I do, I used to do uh, on Res Radio. I was like the person to like give like PSAs, like don't drink and drive, like all that stuff. <laughs> so I was I would go to the radio station and I would like record that stuff. And like that was like my little like theme like around my restaurant. But how weird did that feel? Like you're you, you have all these dreams, like you're like, okay, I'm gonna go to Hollywood and I'm gonna I'm gonna get a movie or I'm gonna get a television show or I'm gonna do this. And you know, you're in that studio for this first time and you look at it and you're like, I'm doing a freaking dunk, drunk driving PSA or I'm doing I'm I'm doing a, a a commercial for a voiceover commercial for classical music. It was like no, are you kidding? Everything so, is so cool. Come on, Roy. I'm sorry. I was so disillusioned at that point. I'm like, look at what I've done to myself. So every little opportunity I've gotten, just like a, the smallest thing, I think it's the, the coolest thing ever. I'm like, you guys want me? Like, what? like even like this, is like, oh my God. Like, I was everything that I get asked to do. Because I feel like me being a YouTuber, I feel like I'm not, I've always struggled with this, even when I was in school. Like, because I'm, I was the only girl in my class. So it's like, I was always not taken as serious as I'm a girl and I'm like in this industry. So I always had to like work twice as hard. So anything that I got, like I was always ecstatic for because like I love my job. I love what I do. And so especially like being a YouTuber though, like I was always not taken like as serious as I would go. Uh, my college would hold like screenwriting and like filmmaking stuff for like these high end like, I don't know. I met like some really bougie ass like writers and like screenwriters and all this. And like with their little fedoras and they were just like so like these guys and like i feel like because i'm a beautiful woman i would meet these men that would write these movies and they'd be like oh like they would talk to me about like movies like or trying to cast or whatever but i'm like are you only talking to me because i'm pretty or because of my work like i don't know i just really really struggled with my work like that so any any type of opportunity i get i always like thought it was the best thing because I wasn't, I felt like I wasn't taken as serious mm -hmm. as other people. Well, Raquel, <laughs> uh, when I was in college, I spent a few months on Standing Rock and I, I worked at their radio station, KLND, and I read the obituaries oh. um, <laughs> and the memorials. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure to this day, in the morning, it starts with a prayer and then it starts with like, Oh, an elder like giving like a tiny little like almost sermon thing and it's me singing amazing grace <laughs> but like years ago like when i was 18 or something <laughs> i'm gonna write that down i'm gonna find that <laughs> yeah kale and d the trailer in the middle of nowhere <laughs> oh my gosh that's awesome yeah <laughs> the first the first time I, I actually tried to write a novel, I don't usually tell people this because it was a 30 day thing and it was a total failure. I was at an artisan residency in Montana and um, there's four of us and um, there was this really horrifying moment where um, we were waiting for our ride. We were going to go to Butte just for the day to see it. We were in this small town called Basin, which is like 30 minutes south of Helena. And there's a filmmaker and a poet and me and um, this really tall, um, sort of carved out of wood, super talented crow painter. She Cheyennes don't like crows to begin with. And he was, you know, he would paint traditional paintings and they were super amazing. And uh, we were waiting for, the, for our ride to pick us up. And he looks at me and says to the other two um, artists there, so they're just letting anyone in now, huh? <laughs> I was like, really, in front of me? You're just going <laughs> to comment on how I'm not Native enough to be at the residency? It was a really crushing moment. <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, boy. That sucks. Yeah. Doesn't happen, I don't know. I feel like... All of us are like mixed, right? Who's like a full blood around here? I'm, Ryan, I've got lots Ryan, of blood, and I'm full of it. I think Ryan's the only full blood, <laughs> but like I feel like all of us maybe have like gone through like something like that, or we're well, because I talk Valley, like a Valley. Girl. Oh yeah, you do. <laughs> <laughs> I have to do this. 
<laughs> but like, I the most of the comments I get on my channel are always like, "Oh my god, you talk like a white girl," or like share like clueless but res or something like that. So it's like I'll just take it because I do whatever. Like I don't care. But um, but I used to be insecure about that though because like anytime people would call me a white girl, like I had to prove like my nativeness or something like that. So mm -hmm. yeah, I used to be like insecure, but now I don't care. Like whatever. I talk Valley. Like, that's who I am. Yeah. yeah. I've, I, I quit letting it bother me a long time ago. You know, it, it used to because, uh, I mean, my mom, like yours is, my mom's white, white. I mean, French and Polish. Uh, my dad's full blood, but I mean, it was, it was always hard. Like when I would go back home and, and get razzed, a lot of time it was just teasing. Um, but when you do go into the, 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 the outer circles, um, like especially, I mean, LA is not a bad place. It's, it's very pan Indian. There's a lot of, you know, different native cultures that come together, like at the powwows at LA powwow and Long Beach and all that. Um, but in certain circles, you know, you, you start to get a little bit of that, you know, that brush off or, oh yeah, you're, you, you're native, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, everything I do is. And that's what somebody said in the chat room. It's like, how can you take, how can you make something more native than it is? If you do it, it is native, period, end of story. Just period, end of story, because that's who you are. Whether you're half blood, quarter blood, you know, eighth blood, whatever, that's that's who you are, period. That's that's what, what you're, you're putting out there in the world every day. Everything that you do, everything that you say, everything that you be is native, period, end of story. Whether it's pop culture or acting or doing a voiceover for obituaries in some town somewhere, it's still native. It, it just is by nature of who you are, you know, and that's, that's it. There is nothing else. And once I finally realized that I just, you know, a lot of the, when, when people try and bust on you about these things, it's because of their own insecurities. It always is. It's always, you know, it's always projection. It's always, they don't feel enough of something. So they want to project that onto you and try and try and hurt you for who you are. So I gave that up a long time ago. I gave a bunch of stuff up a long time ago because, you know, it's just too much baggage to carry around anyway. Hmm. Yeah. Well, in AZ, so you've got uh, kind of the opposite. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's the opposite, <laughs> but you're also, you're also black. And, and you, you said that that's what you present as. And so talking about who you are as a native person, probably has a similar but but different um and i apologize I don't know how to ask a, a a good question um yeah it's messed up yeah yeah <laughs> no okay um i mean it it really just depends on the space that i'm in i mean at this point there's like on the east coast it's not that unusual um to be black and 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 native and their tribes that are triracial and there's there's but there are a, there's a lot of colorism and um there's still a lot of well like i i mentioned earlier i i lived on standing rock and um nobody knew what a pamunkey was there so <laughs> i never even said you know that i was native except to very close friends. Um, I, which was frustrating because, you know, I wanted to be like, no, I am like you, but, but then at the other, I understood that there was a lot of resistance to that. And I also understood that there, it was just very complicated. Um, but I guess now, and I, even when I was living there, I thought, you know, they're going to, they're going to be more people like me. They're going to have grandkids like me. They're going to have great grandkids like me. And it, then they're going to have to like, kind of take a look at their anti-blackness or their, or their misunderstanding of, of how you can be like both identities. Um, and it's true. Like a lot, a lot of my friends have kids that are um, black and Lakota or black and Cheyenne or, or black and Navajo. And it's like, it is something that more people um, on more, it's becoming a more broad, broader experience, I guess. Um, but then, you know, I still struggle because my own tribe still has anti-blackness and um, that's something that my family 
deals with when we want to kind of, you know, I, I'm always saying it's not just who you claim, but who claims you. It's, you know, I don't, I never want people to think that I'm just like somebody who's like, oh, my great grandmother was a Cherokee princess. I mean, this is really my, my family and my culture. But so, so you want to be, you want to be enrolled and you want to be like part of your community. But when there is like actual anti-blackness, it, it, then you have to make decisions like, okay, well, I ended up finding much more um, solidarity with people that weren't from my actual tribe, um, which is is un unfortunate, but it is the truth. Um, but as far as like moving in the world just day to day, it's funny because I'm in a lot of spaces that are all native. And then I feel like I have to kind of like sometimes like correct stuff about black people. <laughs> And then I'm in spaces that are all black, and then I have to be like, "No, guys, casinos aren't reparations." Like, you know, <laughs> I, have to, I have to, you know, explain. So it's, I'm actually thankful for it because I feel like I, I, uh, I take it very seriously, and I like, I, I, I feel like the two communities we we really do need each other. And we have, like I always say, we have medicine for each other. There are things that we can learn from each other. And I do, I don't mind being that bridge. But, um, but on the other hand, again, I just want to, I just want to laugh. <laughs> so it's, like, yeah. it's a lot. It's a lot. But I am excited that that more focus, at least, especially this Native Heritage Month. Um, there's been a lot more focus on black natives and, and, you know, like really what we go through and, and also just how we can be more there for each other. Cause I, I can, I can distinctly remember, I mean, I worked for, um, a native newspaper that's now defunct called the native voice. And I wanted to do a story on the Pamunkey because, you know, as a first contact tribe, we didn't have a treaty with the U.S. government, so we weren't recognized. Um, uh, we were recognized by the English crown um, still to this day, but not by the U.S. government. So they had to go through the recognition process, even though we've had our reservation since 1648 or something. Um, and so I wanted to do a story about that. and. Um, the people who were running that magazine were, or that paper were Dakota. And they actually, she said to me, um, well, you, they don't have recognition because they don't have enough blood. That's why. And, and I was like, well, first of all, that is literally in like incorrect, <laughs> but, but also it's because she was looking at me. I don't look like most people in my tribe, but um, I was very young. I didn't know how to, I didn't know how to like answer to that. Answer to that. I I just felt like that was the first time when I was out there that I was like this is who I am and this is what I want. You know, I want to I want my relatives to be um to be represented in this in this paper and it was a national newspaper and 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 I was just like I can't I can't be the this is why they were anti-black because I can't be the face of the tribe like you know, there were all these different emotions um, and I kind of shut down. Um, and of course I, I didn't pursue the story because I was told that um, it was not, not worthy, I guess. But for a while, like I had such anxiety about sort of like coming out as a person with, that was native and black just because I had had so many of those kinds of experiences. So I guess I'm just happy that we're, we're, we're getting better. <laughs> <laughs> Things are getting a little. Even uh, so, Sophia Giza said, um, "Well, I'm from Riverside powwows, and I would get you look like us, but you're black." <laughs> Somebody wrote that to me. Um, so <laughs> on my Instagram, there's a picture, and I'm like, "I'm black and something else," and it was a joke. <laughs> I'm wearing like a native t-shirt and I, and he wrote me and he was like I think you're native american like he was like <laughs> I don't know but I really think so because you look like us 
And I was like, honey, I know, like, <laughs> like you missed, you just like missed it. But he like, he was like, I just want you to know, you're not saying I was your Native American. I was like, thank you. <laughs> hey, thanks for confirming that to me. Thank you. Oh my God. <laughs> Let me go back to Instagram post so that everyone knows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate your uh, your uh, what is it comfortableness with like coming out or like being comfortable with saying that you're black and native because I feel like so growing up I all of my friends were black and native I feel like uh, I hang out like all my friends are like black I really never found like a real closeness with like the native community because of the way I talk and so. Um, a lot of my colleagues, people I work with, uh, best friends are all black. And so um, my sister-in-law, she's like half black, half Ojibwe. Mm -hmm. And like, I was starting to write a script because um, I, I don't know, all of my friends that are like black and native, they kept telling me about their experiences like with being black and native and like how they're like, oh, I feel like an outsider. Or, like just like the things that they felt that I felt too, cause I'm mixed, I'm half Puerto Rican, half native. So like, I started writing a script, so I was like, mm, I think you'd be like a perfect candidate of like this script that I'm writing about being a black native female and like how to navigate the world or because you're technically like already in two worlds, but you're black too. So it's like, yeah, I, you, I really resonate. I really appreciate everything you just said about all that. I appreciate you writing that because I haven't figured out how to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Whenever I try, I'm like, no one knows what I'm talking about. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like uh, I think the thing that's astounding to me is I grew up around Black and Native, so like the fact that no one else knows about Black and Natives, like it was weird to me because I was like, oh, you don't know, like I, you don't know that there's Black and Native, or like just yeah. like, mixed in general. Like I, I guess I thought everybody knew about that, but no one really did. So, yeah, yeah. It's like a super pretty uh, common thing in Oakland. I worked at uh, a health clinic, and um, was data entry for a while and also like just saw the people that would come in to see counselors. And to me, I, I've known that it's, I've only known that it's a really like not told story and that there's a lot of racism from native people. But I've, to what I've seen just in the Oakland community, there's, it's like a really common mix um, that I just know is not really talked about enough. Yeah. Yeah, I get, I get emails from people that are like, I'm so glad that I know about you, my, my, my children like look up to you because they they don't see people like them. So, you know, I'm I'm feeling good about it, but um, it's not it's not the easiest. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean it's definitely something like that's difficult because I feel like people almost sometimes just don't want to understand that there are like are white natives, there's black natives, like natives are uh, are there's so many of us and so many different types of us and so many different experiences and people don't want to understand that on a level like I was gonna I was doing a talk for some people and they were warming me up with questions and they asked me about BLM and like does that detract from nativeness and I was like first of all no it doesn't second of all there are black natives and I went off on the guy on the phone for like a good like two minutes and he was like all right maybe we won't ask that question to you guys on the panel then maybe we'll just skip over it. I was like no you can ask it if you want I'm ready to answer it and he was like all right we'll see and then um it was kind of a mess, um, the whole thing. But like, I think it's important like, to be firm in that statement that there are black natives and they are native and we're like all these different tribes and we're not a monolith of people. And it, you have to be firm in that because I think there are people who are like, I've never heard of this. And then there are people who just don't want to hear about it. And I think that's part of unpacking anti-blackness, not only in our communities, but in other communities. Yeah, I think it, that brings it all to just like to the conversation around blood quantum and like, you know, the fact that no one, you know, we don't work on systems of divvying up like our identity on uh, percentage levels because, you know, that, that implies that people, you know, that tribes weren't meeting other tribes pre-contact and, you know, that tribes weren't having families with other tribes. Like there was always mixing and, you know, diversity in our communities that existed prior to colonization. But, you know, that, that, when that system got created, it kind of did like a reset. And then that's when it started to fracture. Yeah. My dad, my dad remembers stories. His, his grandmother's telling him stories about how Stan used to steal babies from other tribes to mix the genes up because they're stronger. But not Crow. 
<laughs> and not crow. <laughs> yeah. uh, I, you know, when I was doing research for working at Mount Vernon, I found these, I would look at runaway ads and there's so many runaway ads that were like, uh, he's my, my slave Tom, he's probably by the Pamunkey river on the, at Indian town, which is what they called the reservation. He was like, he, they, he goes there when he doesn't feel like working, he'll come back in a couple of days. Like, and I was like, that's crazy. Like they would just run away to the native, you know, for, oh, and, and one of them said, um, he says he has a wife over there. So if you see him, you know, I mean, this is, I'm sorry, this is macabre. But like, it's a little bit dark. But my point is that like it was clearly a safe harbor for African American people um, until it wasn't. But um, but yeah, like in the beginning, our I feel like our communities were definitely found solidarity with each other. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just don't go to Oklahoma. No, I, mean, Oklahoma, <laughs> I, I can't believe. I mean, it's a red state, but but even even the the natives there. Sometimes I get uh, Sienna. You're you're Oklahoma Choctaw, Oklahoma. I'm Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma. It's like a weird thing if we're talking about like tribal membership and stuff because I'm more Isleta Pueblo than that. But I'm registered with the Choctaw because I can't register with the Isleta Pueblo. Okay. And then my super nana was in the residential schools, so she left. And like I had a lot of our families in New Mexico, and so um, like we have some family in Oklahoma that we're not close to, and so it's been a whole thing of. Um, me, since I got registered when I was younger, like I'm taking, I want to take on the responsibility of if I'm actually going to be a member of this tribe, like learn the language. So I've been learning Choctaw and all of that, even though like a lot of my family is in Isleta. And so like, it's, I think that's part of discussing, because Ryan, when you were talking about blood quantum the other day and what that means and being close to your tribe and carrying on your tradition, like um, it, it was really uh, uh interesting to me just because it's something that I've been unpacking and understanding because I feel strange uh, talking about blood and all that one. I'm, I am a member of the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma and it's a sovereign nation. And so when I list myself, I say Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma because I'm respecting it as a sovereign tribe. Right, right. Sorry, that, you asked for a very short answer and I went real fast through a I lot. Know, come on, what's up? <laughs> no, I mean, I was, you know, to me, Oklahoma is so, uh, so racist and and the, the tribes are, there's a lot of, tribal people there that j just say the most horrible things. And um, uh, I mean, I remember hearing other people um, talk about my grandmother who was very dark and it was, it was, it was always very confusing to me that Indian people um, can be so um, such bigots. Colors. Yeah. Colorism is pretty oh, big. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, they designed it that way in Oklahoma. They designed uh, it's a checkerboard design. It's meant it's meant so, so we can't have unity. It's black, white, and Indian. We're all you know sectioned off so that we would not find ways to each other. Well, and also, Rebecca, oh, I'm sorry, yeah. just, Rebecca Nagel. Uh, she has like, a really good article about how in the early days, colonial times. Um, a lot of people in the five civilized tribes on the East Coast, the elite white men married uh, Native women, and it really changed a lot of a lot of social beliefs. And under like obviously, they brought in the slave trade with them, and they changed the way farming was and the way land worked because land went through women and then it went through white went through men because the white men kind of took over the their sons took over the tribe um so i feel like they the influence of the colonizer the settler is is very present in in the that's why they were called the civilized tribes because they were doing <laughs> things that the white people wanted them or you know they they were becoming more and more assimilated, um, and so yeah, they they took that with them to Oklahoma along with their slaves. So, I would just say that aspects of colonialism trickles through all of our communities and manifests itself mm -hmm. in different ways. Because you know, there's a lot of homophobia and transphobia that exists in our communities, even those that have a long documented history of recognizing multiple genders or sexualities. You know, so it, it's you know just the the navigating 
colonization and folks having to pick, you know, to do what they could do to survive. But then I think that, you know, that co contributes a lot to othering that exists in our communities. Internalized oppression is alive and well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, and Lateral violence. The, uh, <laughs> there's, <laughs> there's a language scholar in um, Browning, Montana, and he's, he, uh, he's, he, he helps me with a lot of my Blackfeet language, and he, he's not enrolled. It's a big deal, you know, the Black system and a big debate, um, but it's so crazy because he, he, knows, he knows the language better than almost everybody there but he can't be enrolled and it it's uh it's i know it's a challenging it's a challenging argument with a lot of people but that that's that always hit me weird because he's the one that's going to help preserve the language down the line you know so so i feel like it's yeah it's hard for him to not be able to be yeah enrolled. yeah i noticed even like any spaces like even like i i is like such a contemporary space where there's a lot of native voices and native artists that are coming out but you know there's a lot of times where we have conversations around how blood quantum is messed up and how these things are incorrect ways to be labeling folks but then we still align by them when it comes to funding students or you know when students yeah. get access into spaces so you see how you know clearly it's a tool that doesn't work but then we still adhere to it in so many ways or that it's still you know because i had a friend who is mostly um indigenous from mexico you know, and all of her or all of their scholarships, like literally said, like non-Indian, you mm -hmm. know, so it's like you, you see the ways that, you know, even though we're trying to create spaces to talk about how these aren't, how these are broken systems, like you still see how we perpetuate that, you know, even with Sienna, like, you know, I'm, I'm a part of two different tribes too, but blood quantum wise, you know, I can only claim one, you know, and that's colonialism in action right there where, you know, you you have to pick and choose what tribe you're going to be enrolled in or who whose community is going to recognize you my my son uh i'm oh, sorry no sorry. Somebody, my son can't enroll in our tribe and it's this crazy math um blood quantum math <laughs> that my my dad called me up um a couple years ago because we were trying to get straightened out and he was working for the tribe um and my dad's an engineer so he he knows knows the math of it he was like the way i got it figured out is uh you're 364th short of a half and so you know he's you know he's basically full blood but we have uh, a 32nd german on his side and a 16th lakota sioux and so we're that much short uh and which makes makes it so my son is whatever twice 364th is short of a quarter which is the blood quantum requirement um, that is just insane yeah that's not okay. I, I mean, I do understand the, the need for protecting our, you know, identity just because there's so many people that, I mean, you know. I, well, there was all those scholarly women that just yeah, got outed for yeah. being white. <laughs> so, it's, or even just, it's, I don't know. <laughs> just the way that narrative has been adopted by like, America that like, oh, way back long ago, I was my parent, my great, great grandma was native and now I'm not. And I think it's a part of there's a fear about that narrative because people want to pretend like natives kind of went extinct. And that's not true. It's not real. And so like in second grade, I was in a school and then I they said she's never going to graduate high school. There's something wrong with her. Um, and so I got sent to another school later. Um, and so at the new school I went to, uh, there were two girls there and they're both blonde and they both said that they were descended from Cherokee princesses. And at seven, I believe them. I was like, mom, they're descended from Cherokee princesses. And I was like, that's not real. That's not true. <laughs> it was just like annoying. And none of the girls liked me. I didn't know why they didn't like me. My mom was like, oh, you invalidated the way they believed about themselves. And like, yeah. that was why they were mean to you. And recently one of their twin brothers uh, he's like my, my friend and I was at his house having coffee and he's like, yeah, sorry about all that, you know, stuff. And I was like, yeah, I get it. Like we all like figure things out and unpack it. He's like, yeah, you know, all that native stuff. And I was like, it's fine. I'm like, don't like, like, it's so hard. Like they were seven, they don't know. But the way that like that narrative exists to like comfort people in the way that America exists now. And I feel like that's some of the fear that plays into some of the protections that exist around blood quantum, even though blood quantum is kind of 
terrifying and incredibly flawed. Yeah, well, you know it's crazy. Oh, you know, sorry. I was gonna say you notice though too, like we're also very privileged to be in spaces where we have these conversations because these aren't happening oh. on our reservations. You know, they're not mm. having community gatherings where we're talking about why blood quantum's not working. Like these tend mm. to be more academic or just more privileged scholarly spaces where these conversations tend to be had. It's crazy that the the reference is always great great grandmother. It's never great great grandfather, and I think it's like it's colonialism telling on itself because it was, it was rape. It was like so often a compromised situation, if not downright rape. So there's all these grandmother references because it, you know that's that was what was happening. Well, also the princess of it, right? I mean the, the romanticization of of this, of the Pocahontas kind of myth. Um, uh, I, I remember watching like a talk show or whatever. And this woman, this white woman, also blonde was saying that she was descended from a Cherokee princess and they, and they found, she found out she was actually, it was black, she was black, she was part black <laughs> and she started crying. <laughs> I just laughed. Don't you guys love, don't you guys do the, like when they start, when you start to talk and, and they, they find out, so they find out you're native and they, Say, oh well, so am I. And then don't you go well, wait, stop. And you grab their hand or something, you go, <laughs> I know, I know what tribe you're from. And you're it's your grandmother. It's your no, your great grandmother, Cher Cherokee, right? And they're like, oh, Yeah, yeah. Go, wait a minute, there's royalty here. You, you got it right. <laughs> wow. And then they feel like, well, we're connected now. We are connected. <laughs> Forever connected. You, you got to try it. Guess the twenty-three and me percentage. Yeah, you got to try it. You got to try it sometimes. It's so much fun. I'm telling you, the, do it that often. Cherokee, whoever that Cherokee princess was, she was a slut. She was a slut. She got around. What's up with those Cherokees? What's uh, up with you Cherokee girls? Cherokees. So I think funny, you guys. Uh, so I was living in Tulsa for about like almost eight years. That's where my ex-husband lived, and so whenever I moved there. I've never been in like a space like that, like Oklahoma, because Oklahoma, I've never been like, felt like segregated being native, I guess, because I guess when you are in Oklahoma, like there are tribes, but like just seeing like the segregation of like black people on this side and like kind of like the four corners of Tulsa, there's like this side is Mexican and this side is black and that side is like really rich white people and like seeing how everyone carries himself when it comes to like being native. Like the IHS, when I walked into IHS, I was like, oh, okay, like there's gonna be native people here. And like, I walk in and everyone's white. And like, I'm like, oh, uh, and like, I learned that they don't need even like quantum, they just have like a card carrier. You have to prove that your grandma or whoever was a native. Mm -hmm. And so, and they'll all still say that to me, like proudly, like it's real. Like they're like, oh yeah, my grandma was Cherokee, whatever. And they like really believe that I feel like it's like believing a lie, but it's like they all really believe that around there. So it's like, oh, okay. They do. Like, they do. And so I was like, oh, I'm native. They're like, me too. And I'm like, not nah, like, well, whatever, you know, I'm not going to question that. And so, um, but I feel like the thing that hurt me living there was like being native for them was like, uh, like free stuff. Like, oh, I can get free shit because I'm native. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. But I'm like, that's so, that, like was really disrespectful because like me being native, like I, I wake up and I'm native. I can't change that. Like I look in the mirror and like, that's who I, I have to live this life. Yeah. And no, so, and then that's what you got to tell them. They always go, well, did you go to school? Did they, did they give you money for school and all that? That's the next conversation after the Cherokee princess conversation. And you go, yeah, Yale. They put me through Yale. I was going to go to Harvard, but instead I, I chose Yale. It was where I wanted to do my... <laughs> I mean, I think it just shows, though, too, the different degrees of colonization that affected everybody. Because, I mean, I met when I worked in um, the University of Illinois, like a lot of the students there come from communities in Oklahoma. And, you know, for them, some of their history, it's like, you just know that you're native. You know, there's no language, there's no documentation of like regalia or, you know, the, there's, I try to like to see it from a perspective of like some folks, you know, just don't have that access or like that colonization has hit their community so hard that they're never going to reclaim, you know, that language or that history. And um, it, it was a like twilight zone for me because I went from, you know, IAI where people come from, you know, the Pueblos in the area or the different tribal communities. And then to go to a place where, you know, a lot of folks really didn't know their history. And that's, 
you know, that there isn't documentation, you know, there's, there's no history to be learned. And, you know, just, I think that that, you know, kind of impacts, you know, their connectedness to their identity as an indigenous person. Yeah, I mean, coming from a first contact tribe, that is exactly true, because our contact with white people was 16, 12. So, you know, the situation, first of all, the mixture is 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 going to be more apparent. But then also the situation you're in with, that's how long, you know, that's three, 200 and something years of it being illegal for you to speak your language and uh -huh. for illegal for you to sing your songs. It was illegal in Virginia for a native person to own a drum, like, since six since like sixteen forty or something like like it's just it's a very it's a very different situation but I think it's also important for us to remember that culture culture grows and culture changes and culture uh, is not it's not stationary and reclaiming language reclaiming songs reclaiming regalia that's a process that a lot of a lot of first contact tribes have gone through in the last, because the other thing we get is, I remember there was a pow, I mean, I'm sorry, the powwow, um, the big one, um, Gathering of Nations. The, uh, one of the people from one of our communities on the East Coast, a man went and to dance um, traditional, and he was in his tradi our traditional clothes. And he wasn't allowed in the arena. He wasn't allowed in the circle because they, they were like, what are you wearing? That's not real, and he was like, "No, but this is what, this is what Mashpee Wampanoag, this is what Wampanoags wear. This is what you see when you see those cartoons about Thanksgiving, like you know, with the, the feather and the loincloth." And they were just like, "That's fake," and they just like didn't let him. So like, pan pan Indianism kind of came in to help us to also on the East Coast to be recognized by the larger tribes that have only had contact for, you know, 100, 150 years. Mm -hmm. um, but now as we step more into like our songs and our languages and our um, regalia, sometimes we we get inter, we get, uh, you know, we, we, we aren't accepted as native because we don't look like the, those Plains Indians or the, you know, Pueblo Indians or whatever. And, so I, I also think it's important for us to to like see each other too, like you know, and the different contexts of our colonization, I guess. Hmm. I don't know. I didn't mean to get deep. Again, all I want to do is laugh. I don't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> but yeah, it's it's rough, you know. A lot of a lot of my tribe is also white passing I mean, um, for those reasons. It's definitely different. The heme about just you're right about the way the different tribes have been affected by different processes of colonization. And like definitely when you go like like when I go to Sleta and I see like everything there, it's been there for so long and they've held it together. I mean that and and you go, wow, like there's so like I think the oldest church in uh, in the continental United States is there, and so it's just different thinking about all these different communities and how they've all been affected in such different ways and grown in such different ways. And so I, I definitely love the idea and, and thinking about just the way that culture does grow and change, and it's it's culture's alive. Um, yeah, that's why I hate the word pop culture on a level because pop culture, and I've said this before, is culture. Sorry, um, and we're evolving and we're growing and it's going to happen. And so the idea that we're going to somehow decide that some parts are stagnant is kind of foolish to me. It's. I always think of the how that we're stuck with horses, like the Indian and the horse, we're like stuck together like centaur. Um, but it's like we didn't have horses until they, Spain brought them. <laughs> um, and there should be a symbol of adaptation, not static, you know, tradition. Yeah. Yeah. And the Italians didn't have tomatoes for their pasta. No, and the Irish didn't have tomatoes. <laughs> what? <laughs> tomatoes are tomatoes are from here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were they were taken to Europe afterwards. One of those gems that we offered the world. And, and and syphilis too. Syphilis was here, and it wasn't. No, <laughs> it's true. Oh yeah, that's, that's true, right. Syphilis, yeah, we gave that. Yeah, we, to, we got them back. 
Well, we got that damn lot. Cherokee princess again, right? I know it's hard. <laughs> I mean, you know, you can't can't do everything right. <laughs> oh my gosh. Oh God, you guys are awesome. Um, I want this to go on all night, but I don't know that that you all want the, the same thing I do. Um, <laughs> I want. Um, so I really want to play that song, but I'm afraid it's gonna like be it's the long. end of us. We're gonna hear it. Well, what about what about just like a tiny clip? You don't even have to play it, or we could just send it out. You could send the link on the side. No, I want to. We should. We should. When we're closing out, we that should be oh, like yeah, our last okay. thing to do. But yeah, I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to say it's time to close us out. See, Roy's going. No, I want to do this. Some more. I want to keep going. I want to keep going. Can I ask Ryan and Tommy? Did you know Taryn Laskin Kip by any chance when you were at school? Oh, really? I have. Yeah, we were in printmaking. Oh, you serious? I have. Look, I have one of Taryn's pieces yeah. on my wall here. Can you see it? That's a no. Yeah, he's an amazing oh, artist. Quantum, so fitting, fitting theme. <laughs> Very cool. Very cool. <laughs> yeah, he's he's amazing. He he's uh, part of the family, um, you know, the Kip family that I uh, I always visit when I'm in Browning, and he uh, yeah, he's killing it at the Mokna. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. I got I gotta the text the the MFA program's only kind of at IAIA. We're we're distance learning before distance learning was cool. <laughs> Somebody told you, Tommy, to look up Curly Horse. So really? tell to uh, Tommy, look at uh, Tommy, oh, look up Curly Horse. What does that mean? I don't know. Oh, and, pot and we gave potatoes to Europe, too, by the way. That was yes. the other thing. And of course, no and chocolate either. No chocolate, no chocolate. If it wasn't for. The potatoes in Peru. Have you guys ever anybody ever been to Peru? No, no. I don't know why I thought about this, but they they have this thing called the Inti Rami, and I went to the Inti Rami uh, festival, and uh, they make these small clay, um, little tiny igloos looking things, and they put potatoes in them, and um, they're called watias, and they they make the potato, they put the potatoes in there, and they cook all all day. They're cooking. And they're all over the place, all over the field at uh, at Saxe Waman, where the where the ruins are. And um, when they open them up, the potatoes are like they look like Easter eggs. They're like um, purple and pink and red and green and yellow, and they're all these bright, bright colors. I just remembered when we went to Peru, seeing that at the Inti Rama, and I was like, "Wow, look at these!" these. And, and they're all small; they're not big potatoes, you know, like we see the. What do they call those russets? The, the ones that the Idaho, the Idaho ones. Yeah, these are little ones. It was interesting. Just a little trivial trivia. When the Europeans got here, there were over three hundred varieties of potato. Ooh. Well, they got a bunch of them from Peru. That's for sure. That I think they're all from there. <laughs> Is that where they all came from? Yeah, from sure. Peru. Yeah. And, and I'm looking everywhere. So I'm, you know, I'm by DC. I'm looking everywhere, you know, corn season. All there is is this white corn. Um, yeah. Maybe yellow corn if you, I can't find. Well, that's that GMO crap. Real true. corn. It's because white people love sugar. I know. It's, sweet. it's they, um, the, 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 there's actually in South America and in Mexico, there in Central America, they're, they're um, trying to outlaw the GMO corns from coming down there because it's destroying all of what's left of the native strains of corn because mm -hmm. it's it's turned into like a plague. So they're outlawing it down there to try and get it out so that they can save the native strains of the corns, all the different uh, corn down in, in South America and, and Mexico and all that. Yeah, it's it's a very invasive uh, species, the, um, the GMOs that... I don't even want to say their name, that big M company or whatever. They've they've spread that across the world and really destroyed it with that stuff. I think Roy is hungry. Me? No, That's no. We were talking about food now. No, I'm I'm on that diet now, so I don't eat much. Remember, but, I'm I'm a little look, You're I'm, hungry. You I'm a little more dangerous. I'm losing weight. I'm getting I'm getting COVID weight off of me now. <laughs> it's going away. It's starting it's leaving my body. It's all down here. It's all below this line here. There's 
we're all going to come out of this and, and see each other and give each other hugs. We'll be all nice and narrow up here. And then it'll, it's all going to be just a big pairs. pair. Pairs. Like those, remember those little things, those weeble wobbles and they don't fall down? Those they, little. None of these people here remember those. I know they're all too, too young. Too young. Those were like back in the 70s, Shannon. Yeah. Some yeah. of their parents weren't born in the 70s. <laughs> don't say that. No. <laughs> They're like, well, yeah, I'm not mine. <laughs> I'm, I'm so happy with the, the diversity we have. I was on a, a call with a, a, a bunch of native TikTok creators. And it and and then our our, our work together here and, and last night. And I'm so impressed with the kind of diversity that we have. Like, I didn't even know there was such diversity in Indian country when I was growing up. And I'm so grateful that all of you all are able to, to speak out and express yourselves and, and be who you are and, and create the wonderful art and uh, words and pictures and, and, and things that you, you do. Um, you know, that's what I, my grandmother would tell me is, is where our power is. It's in our, what others call disability, what others call, you know, as Indian, just by saying you were Indian, you were put in this like special, like poverty category in school. You know, um, you were, you were seen as disabled somehow because you were, you were native. And, and she says, but, you know, we traditionally always saw that, all, any disability, any weakness we ever had always gave us power. That's where we got our power, uh, you know, was, was in our weakness. And for some reason, we live in a world today where the first thing we see is people's weakness and we try to, ah, you know, crush it and, and hurt each other with it. And I'm just so grateful that there's a younger generation of creators like all of you all who are, um, seeing that beauty and seeing that power and, 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 and manifesting it, making it, um, uh, putting it in front of, of people. I'm just so grateful for y'all. Do um, any of you use the TikTok platform? Here we go with the TikTok. Over. Okay. Raquel does. Of course. Of course. Raquel. Sometimes I'm not as active. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it, it scares me like you, Roy. I, I don't know. I don't use it yet. I want to. Though, no, it, I don't. Yeah. So it, it scares me to use it. But I, I watch it like religiously because native TikTok is a thing now. It's like it's just such a thing. And and I love the uh, eight TikTok stars you put into this culture. I oh, look at you. you. You grabbed some stuff for me. for you, Roy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. so what I saw, you know, my daughter, she's she's uh, 15. So she's obviously, you know, a TikTok. You want, can you play it? No, I'm not going to play it. Just keep oh. talking. We got to close, okay. close up shop okay, here. Okay, 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 okay. But I just, I just saw the youth expressing themselves in dance and in art and in comedy, and I was like, at first, it was my daughter was like this 15 year old. I was like, oh my god, TikTok. Okay, okay. And she would send me these like, she would send me a text message and say, Dad, why is this so funny? And she'd send me a text message of a TikTok. Well, one day she sent me um, a native TikTok and then another one and another one. And it was, you know, comedians getting on and, and dancers getting on and, and, and artists getting on and people just saying things, you know, um, uh, PSAs. And, and, and it, I was like, wow, this is a thing. So I put TikTok on my phone. And as I started to, to scroll through and go through TikTok, I was like, oh, my gosh, there's a whole native community here on TikTok because as – you know, as you start to follow them, then your your feed just gets filled with with native TikTokers, and so you're constantly getting content from them. And there's some of the most hilarious skits, some of the most beautiful art, some of the most beautiful speeches, and things that are being said out there on this platform from Indian country. And uh, so I've been bringing it to the show and saying, "Oh, there's so much good content. You guys should be on TikTok watching this because you know everyone thinks, oh, it's TikTok's that 15 year old girl thing where they're all twerking and shit, right? It's it's not. There's there's a whole native culture expression going on in there with short little 30 second to one minute stories and dances and sh and shares of expression. And then you know, just popping around through uh, YouTube and all. That's how I found uh, Raquel and started watching her. So I'm like. 
this stuff is great. The platform that they've been given and what they're taking advantage of um, and people like Ryan putting their artwork out there. And, and it's, it's just been so inspiring to, to see where I've come from through my cultural experience um, without having platforms like this, without having a place to, to voice. Look, Shannon and I have been talking for years because our mentor, um, our uncle told us, you know, hey, you know, you guys need to take these, this message and disseminate it, you know, and this, the, the, don't ever forget who you are and disseminate this information. And of course, he said, Roy, you do something different, Shannon, you go to school. Um, and, you know, we both took different paths, but, you know, he, we came for a full circle and we found a platform where we can actually speak to these things. And now that social media has come out and you, you young people have taken it over and just put your content out there, continue to do so, keep encouraging others to do so and, and steal the steal social media. Native, native country can steal any country just can steal it, you know, take it away and, and utilize it and get the word out and, and disseminate your information and spread your, your, your hopes, your fears, your love, your art, all of that stuff, because uh, the world needs it. They need to see and hear who we are because things are changing. Things are changing. And we're starting to see things move at, 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 um, at very, very fast speeds now. Um, you know, w w when I was, was growing up and, and, you know, the issue of the, the last three decades was the, the, the mascot issue. Um, it was what AIM focused on. A lot of my experience with AIM and AIMers and, and my friends and protests was all in the mascot issue. So much energy was spent on that. And we never got anywhere with it. It was a fight. It was so slap in the face all the time. And then in a matter of a day or two, with, with quickly, even though, but it, it was all those years of work. But it just instantly, it just flipped on its head, you know. So things are changing and the word is getting out. And these platforms and these things and your expression, all of you young people's expression of who we are uh, is what's doing it too. You know, it, you, guys are, you guys are creating what's happening out there. So my hat's off to all you TikTokers and YouTubers and, and artists and, and young people who are spreading and disseminating the information. Please don't stop. Please continue to do so. Please keep sharing who you are and because everything you do every day is native no matter what. No matter what it is, what you're doing is native. So thank you. Breathe. Okay. I asked the chat room if anyone had questions for any of our guests. And please know that we have folks watching on YouTube. Still not too many people watching on YouTube. We need to up our subscriber count. So go to our YouTube channel and, and like and subscribe. We need, we need Raquel to do us a little PSA. Or there you go. And then um, <laughs> maybe we should partner on something. And then uh, also we got folks on Facebook watching on Facebook Live. And we got folks on Twitter or what is that? What does Twitter use? Uh, whatever Twitter uses. Um, we're live there. Folks are watching. Um, please feel free to ask a question. If y'all don't ask a question, I want to play this song um, from Sean's musical um, because I think it would be a great way just to, to, to take us out unless somebody has anything they want to Did you say you were a my? Uh, did I hear you say you were a Meisner uh, student, Sean? Me? Oh, yeah. no. No, actually, no. I, I, I had a whole bunch of training from like, uh, I went to RADA for a summer uh, and then okay. I did, started the public theater and I did did some Stella Adler. Yeah, Stella. Okay. It was Stella that I heard you say then. That's right. I, I actually met Sandy Meisner. I went to school at oh, the really? Playhouse West in, in, uh, on this side, uh, with Jeff Goldblum and Robert Carnegie. And I actually wow. got to meet Sandy back in the day. That is so cool. It That's was, awesome. it was very cool. It was very cool. I know. I wish I could have met some of those legends. You know, I, I worked with the, this, one of the students who was, um, training with Stella. So I feel like I get a lot of her through him, you know? That, yeah. And that's how we got it. You know, it was yeah. passed through all of them, you know? Yeah. And it was, it, it, yeah. Cool. Good. I just, cool. I just want to make that connection. Cause I heard you did, you did say Stella Adler. So, and they were, you know, they were partners. Yeah, they were right there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Just, just actor talk. Yeah. No kidding. I <laughs> Roy did Meisner. Did Meisner just repeat everything you said? Did Meisner just repeat everything you said? Never mind. I saw you trying to do there. 
That's the Meisner That's technique. what I was you doing here. You, you didn't no. get it. <laughs> oh! <laughs> yeah, he did it. I did it to you. So I know I went to. <laughs> <laughs> I thought for sure. <laughs> I thought for, uh, yeah, no, I, I got you. I, I, I <laughs> no, this is where we learned that I'm actually an idiot. But I know, <laughs> how, I know about potatoes. <laughs> yeah. I, I, <laughs> potatoes are cool. I would humor, just pull with the so hard. And, and uh, gosh, there was. Dang. Who else was in there? Um, Charisse Theron was in my class. Um, it was th that whole group of people wow. were all at the same time. Yeah. And we did a, a play called The Playhouse West. Uh, we did a. The, the Playhouse was The Playhouse West. And we did a play called Welcome Home Soldier. And we just repeated that over and over and over. That was Robert Carnegie's yeah. way. Go pee. Yeah, so. oh, yeah, <laughs> probably. Hey, we but, had a, um, Tommy was about to say something though. I'm sorry, Tommy. What were you about to say? No, I was just gonna say comedy for people doing comedy with over Zoom. It's got to be so hard with the glitching and <laughs> because timing is just completely thrown. Yeah. It, what's what I find funny is like the the comedians that are like trying to do stand up without an audience. Because they're doing stand up and and it's just like the jokes are just falling and they're funny but there's there's no laughter so it's like how do they continue to feed off of that energy? It's the energy. There's something about that energy when you've got live people uh, in front of you. Here's a here's a question. Uh, Sophia um, has a question. What advice would you give young native youth in terms of embracing their culture in these times? Anyone? Um, I would just say that don't ask permission, ah. you know, that <clears throat> if that's your community, that's what you're supposed to be learning. Um, I don't think it could be any easier to start doing the research with our phones. I mean, we find all the memes for cats and things that make us laugh, but, you know, there's a lot of books and PDFs and articles that teach us that you know, are written by our community, are written by our scholars and our leaders and our elders that we, you know, we have access to that, or we, you know, we can work with our community to get access to those resources. So, you know, just never feel ashamed or don't ever feel like your, your place yeah. isn't within your community. I love that, Ryan. Exactly I love that. Don't ask for permission because, you know, I understand protocol is important. Protocol is always very important with all, all of us um, and our cultures. Um, but ask for forgiveness instead of permission. Go out there and and do your thing and ask for forgiveness. Forget the forget the permission part of it. I love that. I love that, Ryan. Because people have been so afraid for so long, you know, because of the gatekeeping. There's been a lot of gatekeeping, um, and people that belong in that culture should be welcomed into it. But instead, a lot of the times they're gatekept. And I don't know a lot of the times what the reasons for that is. I've seen it. I've I've watched it occur. Um, and uh, you, you shouldn't have to ask per permission. If you, you are who you are and you want to embrace your culture, do it and ask for forgiveness later. And, and when somebody does yeah. come at you, ask for pro proper protocol and then say, I'll follow that. Yeah, I mean, I guess too, I would just follow up too. Like, you know, there is definitely a period, especially if you're new at learning your culture, or like these are the beginning stages for you. Like there's a time for learning and not teaching, you know, like, take that time to learn the tools that you need and to learn the history instead of going and, you know, being like, well, I found out I'm this tribe. So I'm going to start speaking on behalf of my community. Like <laughs> there's a lot of groundwork that you have to do personally first yes. before you just jump right out there. Yes. Yeah. But as far as embracing your culture, there is no permission needed. You embrace it and you start to learn. No, and and I, also, I would also say, don't do it. You don't have to do it alone. Like you should definitely find community, find Find your relatives, and I think it starts with kinship uh, as much as as possible. Um, and you'll find people. You'll find you'll find community. Yep. And I would say uh, you have a long time. You know, don't try to feel like you have to learn it all in a in a short amount of time. Uh, it's it's uh, one little bit of piece of information here and there that'll come when it's supposed to come and at the right time for you you know there's a yeah that, that that's what i had to learn early i was like ah oh, you got to teach me this ceremony and i want to learn and um they're like it'll happen it'll happen calm down you know i had to slow down and now i'm, I'm yeah so it take, took me a long time to learn that but yeah yeah, yeah. 
Who's doing that? No. <laughs> My dog. <laughs> My dog. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they get mad when it's dinner time. Okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming on. We appreciate you guys. And uh, I hope maybe we can get one or two of you to come back sometime. Yeah, please, please. Um, all right. Well, Raquel, for sure. Raquel. I won't even that's gonna be the show. just call me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> ah. that, that's the show. I'm just going to, I'm going to take a vacation and, 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 and you and Raquel can chat and do TikTok and, and talk about that. Yeah, we can do TikTok reviews, right? We can go on and do TikTok reviews. <laughs> no, that's what Patrick is in Navajo. He does that. <laughs> Patrick's Navajo. Yeah, he was supposed to be with us tonight too, but he he couldn't be with us um, tonight, unfortunately. Um, hey, I want to play us out of here. I want to thank all of you for for showing up, spending your time with us. We really do appreciate it. So does yeah, everyone you know in our uh, chat, um, and know that this is is not just live, but it's also streaming. So a lot of people. Watch during the week, pass it out, send it to your friends, send it out to your network. Are all their links going to be down below in the, in the, uh, in the chat, in the, in yes. under the chat there? Okay, good. Cause I want to see uh, AZs and CNS uh, stuff. Yes. Um, we're going to, everything's going to be on our YouTube channel and on our, um, sorry, there was a little glitch. I don't know if I, I caught all your, um, what you were saying, uh, but we're going to share all the, um, everybody's websites and Good. handles and all of that jazz on is, our website. Which is Ryan's Instagram on there? Uh, in, I in, want to see Ryan's Instagram. Right now or? Is it going to be, do we have the link to his Instagram? Yes, of course we do. Okay. I was just checking. I just want to make sure oh, that Ryan before, I, before we dropped everybody, I wanted to make sure that we had what we, what we I needed will. because there's some things I want to see. Yes. Ryan, I have a question. Actually, my mom wanted me to ask you something. Um, she wanted to know if any of your art was for sale because she really appreciated it too. Uh, she was like watching and texting me when uh, you were presenting. <laughs> she really enjoyed it too. So I was like, I yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I, I make shirts and stuff of my prints every now and then. So I, I keep everything kind of posted on Instagram whenever I do a run. And, um, but that's kind of where I'm at. So. I just did an order, so those are going to be going out this week, and then uh, I'll make a post when next the next run is ready to go. Okay. All right. Awesome. Cool, cool. Y'all are beautiful. All right. Play us uh, out. So, yes, uh, this is brought to you by the Association on American Indian Affairs, the oldest nonprofit serving Indian country since 1922. 22. I'm Two, two, two. I'm gonna play us out with um, the song from uh, Sean's musical, Distant Thunder. Um, let me make sure I'm sharing audio. And uh, hopefully I didn't break something. Uh-oh. What did you do? I don't know. What's wrong? My, my computer's freaking out. Okay. it's. It's working. We are running a little slow. I don't know if it's their server. It's probably their server. I have noticed it's been a little glitchy. Has it? Um, yeah. Did Did right. you go to share screen? I'm share, and then now it's. I'm just getting the spinning circle. Uh, yeah. I think I think we're having a little trouble with the server, to be honest. Give it a try. Uh, I may not be able to show it, you guys. That's okay. Well, if you uh, if you maybe post the link and everyone can try to check it out, it'll be cool. Yeah. I will. And right now my, my computer's froze, so I can't do anything. I'm glad you oh, all can hear me. I can't see you or anything. Oh, oh no. no. <laughs> Did we lose you, Shannon? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. We're still you're still here. You're don't do anything funny because we can <laughs> see you. <laughs> okay, well then why don't you all close it out unless someone can bring up um I can't, um, my 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 share screen is not working. Yet. I think their servers are messed up right now. Okay, I'm really sorry, everyone. I'm gonna include it on. Hey, can um, I? Is, yeah. Can yes. you guys see? Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see everybody. Oh wait, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to do this. Sorry, I'm trying. I was trying to be cool, but I don't know how to do this. If you if you click on the share screen, um, yeah. and then you have to go to the Chrome tab or the tab. Yeah. 
And then, and then just be careful not to share the whole screen so we don't see your nudes or anything. Yeah, I, I was. Don't worry, those are in a file. <laughs> okay, okay, just making sure. He's just staring at his own nude. <laughs> yeah, let, let me just close out about thirty pictures. Uh, okay. Um, we don't want to get kicked out. Oh, sorry. Yes, okay. family show. And then no, click. Know. Click share audio. Be sure you click share audio on the bottom left. And then if you hit share. Well, okay. So, I, and I promise I won't do this long if it doesn't work. You guys, okay, just, go I won't ahead. Keep you here. But up. Uh, so I, but you, so I share at the bottom, there's a share screen, right? Yep. Yep. You click so on if that. I click that. Screen sharing is easy. It's with two monitors. Um. Okay. Da 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 da. Go oh, just go is... to the Chrome tab. It'll, there should be a box there. Go to Chrome tab or whatever tab you have open on whatever browser. Yeah, I see it. The tab is yeah. And then make sure you click the little box in the bottom of the corner there that says Share Audio. If you're doing something like that. Oh darn, I can't figure it out, guys. I'm sorry. That's okay. That's okay. All right, everybody's All right. tired. We've been streaming for a I long know. time. Oh wait, I see. I do see it. Boom, oh, there. Boom. Okay, there it is. Oh no, that's Shannon. Oh wait, I got Sean's too. I'm gonna add is this, Sean's. Uh, is this me? Can you see this? This is it. It's up there now. I have to go to YouTube. It's just an it's email. Not, it's, oh, it's just my email. It's not showing. It's not showing my screen. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I told you, be careful. We good thing we didn't grab the nudes. Wait, you can't see this. Can you guys see what I'm looking at? No, huh? No, it's your email. It's your email. Oh, darn. All right. <laughs> Wait, I'm going right, to get it. I'm going to get it, I think. Here it is. Ah, okay. I don't know what I'm doing. Wait, I'm going to do it. Okay, darn, I'm here. If I was just a little younger, I could have done this. <laughs> <laughs> just a couple Where's years younger. Come, Come on. on. I, could, I could be your grandma. Come on. All right. Here we go. I'm going to share it. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. All right. We're going to play it. Oh, yay. Hello. Me. This is Michael Barron, producing artistic director Can you hear it? of Lyric Theater of Oklahoma. And I'm Can in front it? of the set of Distant Thunder, yeah. the premier Native American musical. Our rehearsals were cut short due to the pandemic, but we are so excited to welcome back the Distant Thunder family next spring, 2021, for this very special musical. But for now, enjoy this special musical preview the cast has put together. Thank you, Michael. Okay, Nixie Coax, hello, our relatives. I'm Lynn Taylor Corbett. And I'm Sean Taylor Corbett. We are the writers of Distant Thunder, along with Chris Wiseman. During this time of terrible upheaval in our society, we reached out to our cast members, both past and present, and asked them to present this song for you. It's Hold On, written by Sean, and Chris Weisman. We hope the indigenous message of our show brings light and love to all of you. While we strive for justice and giving voice to the voiceless, we hold on to the collective humanity that binds us all. When we ran through the camps, a smile on your face, you knew where to go all the time from the shade in the stands to medicine river you knew down the road past the gym up the hill to the school you never let up till the end of the day like the moon chasing sun I tried to catch up, but I fell. I'd put my hands on my hips and yell, hold on, cause I'm running out of breath. Hold on, cause I need to take a rest. Go on, you'll soon be way out of my sight. I held on to the memory that night. And then we ran past the stalls with the food and the games. I'd always get lost in the crowd. When I found you again, you 
say, try catch me if you can. He will cry bread in both your hands. Hold on, can you eat all of that? Hold on, you're making me so upset. So long, I'll leave cause I don't wanna fight. I held on to the memory that night. It's like we had wings and we could fly away. I wonder who I would be if I had stayed. Since I've been gone, so much has changed, and I'm sure there's still so much change I have left to endure. If I can hold on, I know hope will find me tonight. I During Indian days, the voices would sing. I still hear the beat of the drums. We were lost in the dance, and I felt the love of this land. And I know that you understand. Hold on to memories forgot about. Hold Thanks for playing, Bravo. With you guys. Thanks. Oh my God, that's so emotional. <laughs> I really appreciate that, John. Thank but uh, dang it, I'm gonna like fall. I won't be able to be She goes. She's turning the waterworks on. <gasps> All right, here they go. So good. Thank you. Uh, biggest, I appreciate the thing that I kept. I kept thinking was we're so. I'm so used to seeing plays or us and white people in red face and like telling our stories. So like, <laughs> dang it. Uh, <laughs> the fact that everyone looks like us and like oh, thanks, singing, Rebecca. I'm sorry. <laughs> That's why I wanted to do it, you know? It's, really it's so hard to, 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 because it's a, it's a large cast, but I wanted a large of people um, in this setting and uh, with, with just, all the different elements and, and bringing the younger generation and then having something for the elders and, and all the community and family aspects and uh, capturing it in the show. And it's, it's, it's uh, trying to, trying to get it going each year is takes so much energy. So this helps me. It inspires me when I have these conversations with, with everyone here, because I want to keep going, you know, I have to, after we come out of this, have a, have a production of it. Absolutely. Well, you will. Thank you. Absolutely. Just hold on. You will. <laughs> now I got another. I got another, Ooh, cast, those I got another cast member here. Another <laughs> feature. 
That was me inspiring you. That wasn't me auditioning. Oh, no, I'll, call you. I'll call you. Come on, every one of us show. is always auditioning. <laughs> you're you're going to be in the show. It's too late. Sorry. Oh, okay. Well, I'm available. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me see when my waist just shifts his first. Just kidding. Right? Isn't that the joke? Wait, say what? Don't make sure I don't have a shift first. Oh, oh yeah. Just, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <All right. Wait. laughs> I tried. I tried. I'm not good. Sienna, help me. Help me, Sienna. <laughs> She's funny. <laughs> yes, she is. I'm not. I'm not at all. My timing. <laughs> it's the timing thing. I don't have the, the you guys got the timing. Anyway, we better go. We gotta let these people go, Shannon. Let's <laughs> say goodbye to all our, our lovely people. Thank you so much. I freaking love this show. I'm so glad to have you guys on. Thank you. It's for always me. lawyer shit. Shannon always brings the lawyer people in, and I gotta, I gotta listen to law and like, oh, uh, you know, and oh, so you guys have been a breath, of fresh air for me. So thank you for coming. Thanks. So Not much. that the lawyer stuff isn't bad, but I mean, and and we're... next week on attorney <laughs> and. <laughs> Victoria Sweet, I'm sure you're gonna love her. Uh, she's wonderful. She does oh, a lot of work I'm in dead. Indian child I'm welfare, dead. and 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 now works for the Novo Foundation. Yeah. I'm dead. I'm Isn't dead. It? Yeah. So anyway, <laughs> I'm so dead. <laughs> I love you all. Thank you for for joining us. I hope I hope uh, you are part of our family, and uh, we want to see you again on Red Hoop Talk. Um, more to come. Thanks everyone in our chat room uh, and um, uh, like, comment, and subscribe. And thank you so much. And we'll see you next Sunday. See you next Sunday. Bye-bye.